Number 10, what a drag. Bachelor number one, what would you do if I refused to marry you? Well, I would probably get quite violent and lead to the destruction of 10,000 lives at the Battle of Hastings. Might just drag you around by your hair and see where the night goes. William I, or more appropriate, William the Conqueror, was a fierce warrior and the first Norman King of England. Being the illegitimate child he was to the throne, some people didn't exactly respect the power moves old Willie was making. People rebelled, and he crushed them. Oh, and there was this one time that he fancied a woman named Matilda. Being the respected woman that she was, she declined Willie's advances. Willie, not taking no for an answer, promptly dragged her around by the hair until she agreed to marry him. Gee, what a, what a swell guy. Number nine, let them eat cake. France had seen better days in the 1790s. People were starving, the economy was bust, and for some reason, the poor citizens were being taxed the most. When cries were made from the people, they demanded that change be made. King Louis XVI being the great leader he was, he listened to the people and there was no problem ever again. Oh wait, he did nothing and the country had a bloody revolution. The man supposed to be leading his people failed to act. In fact, he did less than nothing, often trying to silence the riots by force. But when people are very hungry and you're living fat with high society, you can lose your head in all that chaos. While the famous quote, let them eat cake, may not have actually been said, it's a good reminder of the disconnect between the upper class and poor. Leaving your people to starve isn't the best idea if you want to be a king for a long time. Number eight, cash back. King George III had a simple ask of the American colonies. Right then, we just saved you all from the French and Indians, so now it's time to do the right thing and pick up the bill. Britain introduced new taxes on the colonies in order to pay back what it had spent on the previous war. But in reality, he was asking the colonies to pay up without much in return. Basically, I'm the king, I saved your skins, give me more money. Which most people at the time couldn't afford. And I'm still gonna boss you around. The British Empire may have been victorious, but it was the colonists who felt all the effects of the war and the economy. This happened multiple times before some patriots had had enough and decided to act. And what he did when the people he was forcing to give money spilt a little tea? Well, he sent British troops for a semi-friendly military occupation. I hate to loan this guy a nickel. In our number seven spot today, we have Don Carlos. I'll be honest, this little troublemaker never made it to the title of king, but he sure was a little too close for comfort when you hear about the kind of things he was doing. Carlos was the prince of Asturias during the mid 1500s as he was the eldest son of King Philip II of Spain. It is said that Carlos may have had some troubles right from birth, which many believe could be due to the inbreeding that was common in the family at the time. Descriptions of his behaviors, though, are far worse than what anyone could have expected. It is said that Carlos did horrible things like hurting or taking the lives of animals just for fun. I mean, nowadays we call that a huge warning sign for potential killers. Back then, they just chalked it up to boys being boys. It is even said that at one point, he purposefully blinded all of the horses in the royal stable. Red flags, they were abundant. Soon, of course, his cruelties would extend to humans, with people claiming that one time he chose to whip a servant girl for for no reason other than because he could. And apparently one time he made a shoemaker eat a pair of shoes that he had made the prince that he didn't like. He was just a little twerp. Carlos was set up by his family to marry the eldest daughter of King Henry II, but after a few hours with the man, she decided there's no way in hell. Like he was so bad, she would rather marry his dad, which she did in 1560. In the end, Carlos was found to be plotting to take out his own father, which landed him in prison in solitary confinement where he passed away six months later. In our number six spot today, we have King Charles VI. King Charles VI started off his reign by being very well loved and respected, but as time went on over his four decades of ruling, he ended up being known as Charles the Mad. His erratic behavior had him hacking up knights, imagining that he was Saint George, and he would also have bouts of amnesia where he would be able to recognize some people, but not his wife and children. This is all very strange and of course quite sad as he was obviously exhibiting signs of extreme extreme mental illness, but one of the strangest symptoms was him believing that he was made of glass. He was terribly frightened of falling or being jostled too hard, and he would actually insert iron rods into his clothing to try and keep himself from shattering. But then he 
would also apparently run wild at top speeds throughout the halls of the castle or the streets, which would obviously mean that he was totally abandoning his fear of fragility. It apparently got so bad that he had to be held inside with the entrances bricked up. Sadly, he continued on this path until he passed away in 1422. In our number 5 spot today, we have Nero. For this one, we are going to be taking it all the way back to the age of the Roman Empire. When we think back to these times, they weren't necessarily the most kind, peaceful times, but there certainly are some characters that stand out as being particularly brutal, and one of those is Nero. Throughout his reign, he wreaked havoc on the Roman Empire, he burned cities, he killed thousands of people, including every member of his own family, and I mean, we know the inventive execution methods of the past, so you can probably guess at just how brutal all of these were. Most Roman sources give us an almost completely negative review of him in reference to both his personality as well as his reign as a leader. He was called compulsive and corrupt, and it is believed that he is actually to blame for the great fire that burned Rome, but instead he used the Christians as a scapegoat so that they would receive punishments rather than him. In the end, after being declared a public enemy by the Roman Senate and realizing that the rebellion would be lost, he ended up taking his own life at the age of 30. In our number 4 spot today, we have Pol Pot. Pol Pot was the leader of the Cambodian revolutionary group called the Khmer Rogue, and this group with him at the forefront went on to try and destroy the Cambodian civilization. This wasn't necessarily how the group started out, but once Paul and others who shared his ideals came to lead it, things quickly became very dark. He is likely one of the only people who ordered a mass jet in his own country. The reasoning behind all of this is because he believed that destroying the civilization was the best way to start a new regime and bring in a new age. He ended up serving as the Prime Minister from 1976 until 1979, during which his policies led to the deaths of around 2 million people, which is horrifying. That was about 25% of the entire population. He even liked to keep the skulls of those he had killed. Just gonna say, it seems as though politics was the mask for someone who just really wanted to kill people. There are so many horrific details surrounding him and the things he did, much of which I can't even repeat here on YouTube, and that is exactly how he landed a spot here on today's list. He truly did some horrendous things, and in the end, went on to live the rest of his life and died of natural causes before he could even answer for any of his crimes, which is just the most frustrating end to a horrible tale. In our number 3 spot today, we have Maximilian Robespierre. Okay, I'll be honest. This is quite a polarizing one. Maximilian, on one hand, was great. He advocated for universal suffrage, for unrestricted admission to national posts, and he was against racial and religious discrimination. Especially in the time he ruled in, this was huge. Of course people were against him, but in our modern views, he was way ahead of his time in these beliefs. On the other hand, however, he was extremely violent and was the leader during most of the French reign of terror that happened during the revolution. It is said that during this time he was responsible for imprisoning somewhere around 300,000 and killing somewhere around 40,000. During the revolution in 1793, he was elected head of the Committee of Public Safety, and from that point on, any voice that was in opposition to the change that was happening was struck down and silenced by him. Throughout the years, his ego and power only grew, which led to him being a little too quick to use the guillotine, his favorite execution method. He was getting a little too cozy with that thing, so much so that he began to use it even on people who had, at one time, been his allies. We saw this clearly when it came to the execution of George Danton, who Maximilian had executed after he suggested maybe chilling out on the whole reign of terror thing. In the end, people caught on to this tendency for violence and horrible punishments, which definitely lost some of his public support, and this was only exacerbated when it was realized that he now had beliefs that directly contradicted those he had earlier, like when he tried to create a national religion called the Cult of the Supreme Being. By the time 1794 came around, he was overthrown, and later that year he found himself being executed by, you guessed it, the guillotine. Not good. No thanks. In our number 2 spot today, we have Vlad Tepes. Often referred to as Vlad the Impaler, he was the ruler of Wallachia three times between 1448 until his death in 1476. He is often regarded as one of the most important rulers in Wallachian history, and to many he is a hero, and this is not to disregard that. But you don't get a nickname like the Impaler by being a passive, peaceful guy. Vlad was known for his brutality and his love 
of impaling people, but it is also said that everyone's favorite vampire, Dracula, was modeled after him. This is because it is rumored that Vlad liked to dip his bread in the blood of his enemies before eating it. I prefer a little olive oil and balsamic vinegar with mine, but hey, to each his own, I guess. Vlad is known for his intimidation tactics, which included having bodies of those he had killed lined up outside of the city so that any enemies approaching would know what fate they had coming. Like I mentioned before, many regard Vlad as a hero. I mean, it is abundantly clear that he fought as hard as he could to protect Romania and Bulgaria from the Ottomans, but that doesn't mean that the horrific things he did have been forgotten either. Vlad definitely left quite the legacy behind when he was killed in 1476. In our number one spot today, we have Joseph Stalin. Stalin was a Georgian revolutionary and Soviet political leader who governed the Soviet Union from 1922 until his death in 1953. Despite the fact that he started his time governing the country as a part of a collective leadership, by the 1930s he had consolidated all of the power and went on to begin acting as the Soviet Union's dictator. During his reign, Stalin was responsible for the deaths of over 60 million people, 20 million of them being his own. Apparently the math works out to about 40,000 people per week, which is just unbelievable. For almost 30 years, he reigned the Soviet Union with terror and violence. I mean, his decisions led to a famine that killed millions of people. Also, the lives he took weren't just of his enemies. I mean, how could one person have 60 million enemies? He would take the lives of families of people he liked. He just took too many lives, was too paranoid, and while he was powerful and smart, he could also be an absolute monster. This is all perfectly summed up when he said, quote, one death is a tragedy, a million deaths is simply a statistic. Number 10, King Midas. Most people know the story of King Midas, but in a nutshell, he was a king who was granted the power of the everything he touched turned to solid gold. So, no, he didn't exactly buy anything with that kind of power, but the man can have anything he wants or buy anything he wants. It's a lot of gold. This sounds great, but it's really awful for a couple of reasons. One, that is pretty much the moral of the story, and the other is, well, some basic uh, economy stuff. The first reason this would suck is that one, you should never be too greedy, and you really shouldn't. And you should always be careful what you wish for. This blessing quickly turned into a curse as Midas could no longer eat. Which, that's bad. Not eating and everything touch turn to gold. Oh, you couldn't hug anybody, it's terrible. The other issue would be his wealth. You'd have to be very careful on how many items you actually touched, as producing too much gold would eventually devalue the price of gold. Especially if you touch a bed or something, that, that's, that's a lot of gold. Imagine how much a solid gold bed would weigh, or how much that would be worth. So in reality, you would be both starving and poor. Number 9, Mansa Musa. Sort of related to the King Midas issue, Mansa Musa was probably the richest man to ever walk the face of the earth. A king from northern Africa who exploited his country's salt and gold reserves. His estimated wealth today would be around the $400 billion mark. $400 billion US. Ooh, that's a lot of money. Tough to actually measure it exactly because it was from so long ago, but it could be less, and some say it could actually even be more. Mansa Musa went on tour one year to see all the beautiful things he could of the ancient world. And you can't take a little vacation without buying something at the gift shop. Mansa Musa was so rich and spent so much money in a few towns that he visited that he single handedly upset the economy of those cities. Elon Musk wishes he could. So he basically bought a lot of stuff, and it was unusual because it upset the economy. Like, he destroyed the economy of those downs. That's insane. Number eight, Michael Jackson, the king of pop. Ah, see, I got you. I pulled a sneaky on you. But yeah, he's still a king. And maybe he was the biggest celebrity who ever lived. Would Halloween really be Halloween without Thriller? And how could cool guys let you know they were cool in the 80s if they didn't have all that leather jacket and stuff? You wouldn't be able to know. You just wouldn't. Well, maybe some things you don't know about Michael Jackson were his shopping habits. The man loved shopping. And with that kind of money, well, you can do anything. Well, some may remember his chimp, his Neverland Mansion, complete with carnival rides and arcade, and even an oxygen chamber in case Darth Vader was coming over to stay the night. However, something very strange the man tried to do was he tried to buy a very strange man himself, or rather his bones. For some reason, Michael had a fascination with the Elephant Man, a man with severe facial deformities and freak show performer from the late 1800s. Michael tried to purchase his remains. That's it. That's the point. He tried to buy him. They wouldn't let him, but he tried. That's a weird thing to buy. I've never, when I, whenever I hit the number, I don't go, hey, 1-800-Museum people, someone bring me King Tut. I want it. Boy. Number seven, Queen Caroline. Queen Caroline, 
Ba, ba, ba. She went out in a horrible way. We can't sing about her. History remembers Queen Caroline for the way that she went out. It was bad. It was actually written down in an epigram attributed to the 18th century poet Alexander Pope. Here lies wrapped up in 40,000 towels, the only proof that Caroline had bowels. Again, it rhymes. Why do all the, why is everything rhyming? This is so awful. Who can be like, yeah, yeah, write that down. That's good. That's good. Wait, wait. It does rhyme. That's good. That checks out. Rest in peace. My gosh, her husband, he was certainly no help at all. Caroline was previously married to George IV, and this guy locked her out of Westminster on Coronation Day. So yeah, she went out in a horrible way, but let's not forget the marriage that came beforehand. That wasn't pleasant either. Nothing in this guy or this marriage was pleasant. Number six, Henry VIII. Of course he's back. He had six wives, and it was pretty much entirely bad for all of them, yeah. It was the late 1400s. Henry took the throne in 1509. This guy was only 17 years old when all this madness began to unfold. Only days after the execution of Anne, who I mentioned on part one of this list, so days after he married his third wife, Jane Seymour. Anne Boleyn and Jane Seymour's mothers were first cousins, so they were close, and during all of this, they, of course, went head to head more than once. Jane died shortly after giving birth to Edward VI on October 12, 1537. I can't mention King Henry's wives and leave a couple out. This is just a history channel. We have to mention all of them, okay? Number five, George V. Turned out this guy loved stamps. Maybe a bit too much though, I'd say. It was almost distracting. It was taking up many hours of his day. Like, you know, focus on other things, like say maybe, I don't know, the war. King George V continued to collect stamps during World War I. Everyone's trying to stay alive. George is just in the background like. <laughs> like all collections, they started at an early age. It's now at a point where it's just, you know, past impressive and borderline strange, especially if you're a royal, like you're really going hard with this. This guy had albums on albums of stamps. He had around 330 albums, each was 60 pages, full of stamps. That's 20,000 pages full of stamps. That's a lot, way too many stamps. So naturally, he was nicknamed the King of Stamps, or rather the King of Philately. That's the official term for collecting stamps. We're historians here, we have to make it official. Back in 1905, he set an all-time stamp record. Ho ho, the most money ever spent on a stamp. This guy dropped like 220,000 on one single stamp. Somebody even asked the prince down the road if he had heard about the fool who had spent 1,400 pounds on a stamp. And he was proud, he was like, Oh, that fool? It was I. Number four, Rudolf II. The Holy Roman Emperor from 1552. He was known as a collector. Yeah, some princes collected stamps, others collect zoo animals. We're all different. Yeah, his castle was home to lions, tigers, and not bears, but orangutans. So good luck getting your eight hours. He also collected human artifacts, like body parts after they've been, you know, so that's. Watch your step, I guess. Welcome to MTV Cribs. Don't mind the jar of eyes. Watch out for the lion's tail. Careful. What a mess. He's quite important in history though, I guess. He supported the scientific revolution and he also poured tons of money into astrology. So next time you read your horoscope, remember it's bones in the jar Benny that's responsible for that one. And also in case you're wondering, yeah, he didn't pay attention to any of his wives or anything like that. He was just, no, nope, jars for me, jars animals. I'm all set. Number three, Don Carlos. Spanish crown prince, the guy who just enjoyed being the worst human alive. Let's talk about him. Back in the mid 1500s, the eldest son to King Philip II of Spain was, yeah, I wanna say worse things, but he was just a really bad person. YouTube, he was just a bad guy. Now it's been noted that he was born with a hunchback and one leg was shorter than the other. Historians like to bring that up first and how maybe he had the odds against him with these disabilities growing up and people often feel bad for him a little. To that I say don't. No, don't do it. Don Carlos was made hero of the opera by his dad. Dude was fine. Philip II of Spain? Yeah, he would hurt a lot of people. He would hurt animals and people just for fun. According to historians, Don Carlos once made a cobbler eat a pair of boots because he didn't like how the pair of boots looked. He made somebody eat boots. We're not gonna feel bad for him on Bumblebee today. That's not what we're gonna do. He was also set up to marry Queen Elizabeth of Valois, the eldest daughter of King Henry II, but after a few hours, she was like, no, that's not gonna happen, no way. So she married his father instead. That's what happens, that's what happens when you're In 1564, a few brides were lined up for Don Carlos. Mary, Queen of Scots was one of them. Margaret of Valois, we know what happened with her, and Anna of Austria, but his mental conditions grew worse and it went south, shocker. Number two, heart of glass. King Charles VI, once nicknamed the beloved and then quickly nicknamed the mad. What happened? After he became king of France in 1380, he would have these 
episodes, let's call them. He would believe he was made of glass and he didn't want anybody to touch him. He had this glass delusion, which was surprisingly not uncommon, believe it or not, for this time period. Believing you were made out of glass in some way, shape or form, be it in your head, butt, shoulders or back, really spiked around the mid 1400s and Charles VI, AKA Charles the Mad, he wouldn't let anybody, not even his wife, near him at all. I'm not making fun of somebody for having a fear like that. I mean, most likely historians believe he was schizophrenic, so obviously I'm not ripping on that. But Alexandria of Bavaria, another royal who had this glass delusion, she too believed she had swallowed a grand piano made of glass, so she had to enter rooms sideways to avoid it chattering. I don't know what's going on with this glass delusion, but I'm glad it went away, I don't know. And finally, number one, King George IV. Voted as England's worst king by historians. So that should already tell you a good amount of this guy. George was another one of those monarchs who was a little too invested in his, you know, intimate side quests, if you know what I'm saying here, like all these other kings we've talked about. He was a bit busy being a stupid fool. This man was trying literally everything to get a woman to sleep with him. Although he was the king and he was already set up, he was like, nope, I'm gonna go and keep trying with strangers and random. And he would throw a tantrum if they said no, or he would threaten to end his own life if he didn't get the girl. Like, you know what I'm saying? One of those kind of monsters. He would also keep uh, trophies, lack of a better term, of all these conquests afterwards. He would ask each people that he slept with for a little piece of hair and then he would keep them, he would like store them. Back then it was kind of common, I guess, for lovers to keep locks of each other's hair, weirdly enough, because you don't have phone numbers or like any sort of way to remember someone, photos, I don't know. So you kept their hair. But after the king died, his brother found 7,000 envelopes, each with a lock of hair that was, quote, enough to stuff a sofa, end quote. So yeah, I'll leave you on that note. There's a hair in my mouth, that's kind of gross. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Ivan IV, or commonly known as Ivan the Terrible. He was the son of Vasily III, who is the Rurikid ruler of the Grand Duchy of Moscow. After his father's death, however, at just three years old, Ivan was named the Grand Prince, and by the time he was 16, he was declared as the Tsar or Emperor of Russia, officially establishing the Tsardom of Russia. Ivan and his reign are certainly known for the transformation of Russia from a medieval state to an empire but not without a huge cost to the people of Russia, as well as a hit to the long-term economy. Ivan has been described as being intelligent and devout, but also prone to paranoia, rage, and episodic outbreaks of mental instability that only increased the older he got. One of the main points of extreme violence and viciousness was the massacre of Novgorod, which saw the deaths of an estimated 2,000 to 15,000 people, as well as a shocking amount of acts of extreme, violent cruelty. In the later years, like I mentioned, his violent tendencies only got worse, which led to him doing things like striking his heir in the heat of an argument so badly that it left him with brain damage. In the end, Ivan the Terrible met his demise from a heart attack in 1584. Yeah, they say that impaling hundreds of people every day isn't great for the heart health. Someone should should have let him know about vitamins and minerals, or maybe some good cardio heavy exercise. I don't know. In our number nine spot today, we have Leopold II. As the second king of the Belgians, Leopold has been said to be responsible for the deaths of somewhere between two to 15 million people. Yeah, million. It wasn't in Belgium that he committed his atrocious acts, however. It all started when he claimed himself to be the founder and sole owner of the Congo Free State, which was a private project he undertook on his own. Leopold loved colonialism. He wanted to colonize everything he possibly could. And this is why he started the International African Society, which he used to travel to Africa, claim land that obviously wasn't his. And we're not talking about a small piece. We're talking about land that is several times the size of Belgium. And many countries just let him do this and allowed him to freely rule this land. This is definitely already bad enough, but of course things only got worse. Leopold had his own private militia that he used to force the indigenous population into hard labor. While Leopold was doing this, of course, for economic reasons, he also was just doing this because he was a messed up guy. He was terrible. He made those who lived here harvest and process rubber, and the punishments for those who didn't harvest enough for him were extremely severe. Not to mention, it is also said that sometimes he would just inflict harm because he could. Eventually, a stop needed to be put to his wrongdoings, but of course he was going to do everything he could to hide some of the horrors he did. The entire archive of the Congo Free State was burned, and he told his aide that even though the Congo had been taken from him, quote, they have no right to know what I did there. 
The Congo was taken from him but remained under the rule of Belgium in 1908 until the Congo was given independence in 1960. As for Leopold, well, he remained the ruler of Belgium until his death in 1909, but the secret was out now and no one liked him. In fact, his funeral procession was booed by the crowd because everyone was angry at him for the things that he had done. In our number 8 spot today, we have Qin Shi Huang. While this leader is often credited with creating the first unified Chinese empire, the Qin dynasty, these accomplishments didn't come cheap. When he came to power in 221 BCE, he strictly followed seven principles, which not only pushed for severe punishment, but also acted in contraries and issued unattainable orders. He also is said to have been extremely paranoid about the power of the educated, which led to him burning books so that no one could ever learn what was in them, and he also killed 460 Confucian scholars in just one year, which some claim was because they were unable to make him immortal? Huang wanted not only to establish a transport system, but also build a wall to keep out enemies, and this meant that he had to relocate at least 120,000 families. He declared that all would be equal under one law, and then taxed everyone heavily, and because of these heavy taxes, as well as the insane labor that was expected to create the wall and the transport system, thousands of people were overworked, starved, and perished. He also had laborers create a massive tomb for him, complete with 8,000 life-size terracotta warriors and horses, which you may be familiar with because now it is rumored to be an extremely haunted place. I mean, an evil ruler's resting place? Yeah, of course it's haunted. Number seven, George the First. King George I, couple of Georges on this list, okay? Long before his British ruling days, George was in Germany. He was actually the elector there, and he'd been married before around 1682. Originally, he married Sophia Dorothea of Seal, but the entire time they were married, it was horrible. George would straight up bring other women home because he just felt like he could. Like, he, he literally argued that he could, given his role. He's like, oh, I could have these women, and we could do all this in front of you? Of course, I'm this person of this. Like, no, you're a fool, you're a jerk, really. He would have numerous mistresses and he would purposely flaunt them. So Sophia thought, okay, if you can have numerous side hustles going on, I'll move on myself. So she began seeing a Swedish count. <laughs> okay. She began seeing Philip Christoph von Konigsmark. Now when George inevitably found out, he was violent at this point. He was upset, he divorced Sophia and then imprisoned her. Yeah, when he became king of Britain later on in 1714, she didn't come with him. Yeah, it's not just horrible with Sophia either. The Duke had also been taken out, sadly. His love for Sophia ended up getting him killed. What a mess. All these Georges are so messy. The worst. If your name's George, don't be a mess. Just be nice. Hit that thumbs up if you're a George. Change the game. Change the stats up. Number six, heir to the throne. Okay, I kicked off this list roasting Napoleon and his licorice choices, but of course, he's done much worse things than have bad breath and stained teeth. Napoleon's marriage to Josephine was first fueled by love and friendship, but things quickly changed. Marie Josephine Rose Tasher de la Pagerie was born in 1763. She had two children with her first husband, but that marriage was also not a happy time. They separated, and Josephine met Napoleon in 1795. Napoleon, at this point, was married at the time and they had an affair and they were deeply in love, like actually in love, and Napoleon proposed to Josephine in 1796 and they married later that year. Two days after their wedding, Napoleon led the French army in Italy and while he was gone, both of them ended up having affairs. So many affairs in this. Like, does love even exist? What the hell? 1804, Napoleon crowned himself and then crowned Josephine, proclaiming her empress. A few years passed, and after finding out Josephine couldn't bear any more children, Napoleon made a list of possible and eligible princesses. Just a list, and just left it out. Like, how, how awful is that? In November 1809, Josephine agreed to the divorce, and come 1821, Napoleon Bonaparte's final word on his deathbed was, Josephine. Yeah, a little darker than licorice, just a tad. Number five, King Henry VIII. The second wife of King Henry VIII. She was found guilty of treason, and she had been charged with having sexual relationships with five others, including Lord Rochford, AKA her brother, George Bolin. She had also apparently, apparently, had relations with Sir Henry Norris, the king's close friend. And when I say close, I mean, they were really close. He was the groom of the stool. So they were close, and on top of this, Anne was also found guilty of conspiring to kill her husband. Hmm, I wonder why. This list will explain a few reasons. Now, it's since been proven that these crimes were a bunch of rubbish. Anne wasn't present when these events even went down. She was still recovering from the birth of her daughter, future Elizabeth I. So there's no way she was fooling around with the groom of the stool in October 1533, Your Honor. 
All five guys involved were executed on Tower Hill May 1536, and then two days later, Anne joked about her own little neck before being taken out with the sword herself. Yeah, all dark. There wasn't even a coffin for her burial. Somebody had to get an old elm chest from the Tower Armory. How horrible is that? Number four, a bit better, Another one of King Henry VIII's wives, Anne of Cleves. Where do we even begin here? This one is, honestly, this one's pretty sad, man. Anne was right in the middle of Henry's wives. She was married to King Henry for six months, and it was seen as quite strategic, in a way. Henry's chief minister convinced him to marry one of the sisters of Germany's Duke of Cleves, either Anne or Amelia. So in order to decide, King Henry requested that Hans Holbein travel to Cleves to paint a portrait of each sister, and then come back and compare them. This is like the birth of Tinder. I'm not even joking. This is how he did it. This man compared portraits and then chose Anne because every man praiseth her beauty. Yeah, compared her to the silver moon. Yeah, try that on a dating site. Write that in. I praiseth thou beauty, madam, to a silver dollar. A silver sea sand dollar shining in the moon. What? I don't know. Just click it. Click send and see what happens. Then a treaty was signed. A few weeks later, Anne arrived to England, and Henry was beyond upset because she looked nothing like the portrait, apparently. How horrible is that? Ah, you look nothing like this Victorian painting. How dare you? It's 6 a.m. and you've been riding a horse for four weeks, and you don't look like this Victorian painting? Shame. He tried to stop the wedding, but it was too late at that point, so they had to follow through. And on January 6, 1540, their marriage was official. You can't unswipe this marriage, rich boy. And later accepted the divorce, gladly, and then lived as the king's sister peacefully until her death in 1557. Number three, Christian VII. Christian, there's an ironic name for what I'm about to tell you. The prince that couldn't keep his hands out of his pants. I don't know how else to say it, here we go. Christian VII of Denmark, he was, he was a young lad, he was spoiled, he was a little comfortable with his body, maybe too comfortable, and he would often just have his hands in his pants hanging out. He was like one of those, you know, rich king, he was kind of like Joffrey from Game of Thrones, he would just have his, just sit back and like suck on candy and stuff and just, you know, fool around. I don't know, it's gross. Middle of dinner, this guy would pass around food to his family with those gross hands. He would alternate hands and pants to handing out food. What a little twerp. Now, it's unknown, but historians believe maybe, just maybe, he was a tad mad. Who's to tell? Either way, don't touch the rye bread, Christian. Thanks. Go wash your hands. Twice. Number two, King Henry VIII, again. Of course, we have to talk about Henry VIII again, again. He's Pretty bad, I'm not gonna lie. Henry VIII was king of England from 1509 to 1547. He's been married a handful of times, as we've heard by now, and all of them have went south. When Henry married Catherine, he was 49. She was a few years younger. She was actually a lot younger, classic 1500s way too young. And when they got married, Henry was not the same as he was when they had met. He had received a nasty jousting wound, so now he was gravely overweight. He didn't do anything. He just laid around all day and complained. So Catherine, of course, just wanted some, you know, shred of a life. And being, again, quite young, too young, she decided to look for love. Well, God forbid. God forbid you try and have a life in the 1500s because then the young queen was accused of having an affair and was publicly and horribly taken out in the courtyard. And finally, coming in at number one, Henry II. The relationship between Henry II of England and Eleanor of Aquitaine is pretty memorable. It's memorable in all the wrong ways, of course. When they first met, things were good, dare I say, with both of them. They were both young, and he was gonna be king. He was young, king, guy, young man who's gonna be king. And Eleanor, I mean, she was married, but once she got an annulment, their love was good. You know, their love was good and young and ready to be young king stuff. After the annulment in 1152, Henry and Eleanor tied the knot officially a couple weeks after. Love moves quickly, apparently. Henry started having affairs, because of course he did. At this point in his list, we're not gasping at affairs, sadly. But come 1173, Eleanor had convinced their sons to go against father. Yeah, Henry didn't take this well, and he had Eleanor locked up for 16 years. He had died, so after that point, she had resumed the royal roles, because at this point, those two boys had grown up and inherited the throne, Richard and John. But being locked up for that long, what a nightmare that relationship was entirely. I figured we'd end on a kind of tame one, one where she kind of came back and it was good. Kind of good, dare I say? I don't know. Kicking off the list at number 10, a goodnight kiss. We'll start off funny, okay? History can be funny sometimes, even when it's not meant to be, and it's meant to be completely serious, I can't help but read this information and laugh. Royals were sweating constantly about people trying to take them out, of course. I mentioned Boy Jones on here a few times. That guy stalked the queen over and over for years. Historically, these royals have been on the lookout for enemies, and the way that they prevent these attacks, yeah, sometimes it can be a little funny. 
Like the kissing sheets, for example. Have you heard about this weird position in the castle? What an odd job this is. A great deal of monarchs hired taste testers to make sure nobody poisoned their ale, which is, you know, a pretty lousy job there. Either having a good day or a bad day, no in between. But they also had a guy kiss the king's sheets every day, just he just kissed the entire bed. The king size, may I remind you, massive bed. King Henry VIII, this guy hired somebody to literally just go in, get snuggled up, and just make sure the king's bed wasn't poisoned. There's nothing on it that's gonna make the skin go all ouchy. But he would just get in his bed and just Let's go to sleep for a bit. You are required to make the king's bed every morning, of course, and before he gets back in, you gotta get in and you gotta get in and kiss that bed, man. You gotta kiss that bed real good. Mwah, mwah. Let's go. Mwah. All right, time to clock out for the day. Mwah. One more for good luck. Clothes as well. That was touched. Maybe not kissed, but it was for sure worn and touched. With It's so weird. Guy's wearing my clothes in my bed. No way. I'd rather get poisoned. Like, yo, take my jeans off. Who is that guy? Get back here. Like, imagine marrying that king, and it's like, oh, hang on, before we get snugged in, this guy has to go and kiss your sheets. She's like, ew, what? Why does my sheets smell like breath? Everything smells like breath. Number nine, enemas. We gotta talk about perhaps one of the worst sights to see in the household. This, yeah. Back in the olden days, ye olden days, enemas were the talk of the town. Well, rather, the palace. Like most things in the 1400s, only the rich could afford the enema supplies. Specifically, King Louis XIV. Guy loved enemas. Just big old fan of enemas. It's believed that over the course of his life, Louis XIV received thousands of enemas. Thousands. It's a lot of, a lot of decimals. Decimals for enemas. In just one year, Louis received 212 enemas. Like, guy, that's like 112 too much, I'd say. I don't know. He would always take it a step further, and dare I say, a step fancier, by using um, almond milk for the enemas. Imagine being married to a guy and he pulls out almond milk and you're like, oh, no, not again. Come on, Louis, please, I just ate. Number eight, no bathing in this house. Bathing in the olden days wasn't fully understood, if that makes any sense. Like in a medical book, in an official 16th century medical book, the medical advice was use not baths or stews, nor sweat too much, for all openeth the pores of a man's body and maketh the venomous air to enter and for to infect the blood. First of all, huh? What? What does it even mean? Why is every shred of medical knowledge always written in riddles? God forbid you have bronchitis in the 16th century. A doctor would just be like, ah, yes, just a drop of ale and a witch's flick and you'll be on your way. Like, what? Do you have any halls? Help me. Help me, dude. No, I'm just mad. I just, like, bro, I have pneumonia. I need, I need medicine. So, of course, they thought that taking a bath would make you sick. Of course. So, King James IV, apparently, this guy never took a bath in his life. And his hygiene was so bad that he would sometimes pass lice to others just by being in the same room that he was earlier. So not at the same time, he would come in, do his king stuff, leave, and the lice would be like Pew! and they would just wait in that room and get on someone else. That's so gross. That's horrible. Lice would emit off this man. Like the, he's like the stinky kid from Charlie Brown with the stinky cloud. That's just like lice around this guy. <laughs> Margaret Tudor was married to King James. Yeah, must have loved the no bathing thing, eh? Oh. Number seven, Terrible Ivan. He wasn't called Ivan the very friendly and generous and would for sure never cause any harm to anyone ever. He was Ivan the Terrible, and for good reason. His actions are very unholy. Let's start with the fact that he killed his son's pregnant wife. And when his son came to confront dear old dad, his son was struck with a pointed staff, killing him in a fit of rage. A legend tells us that once St. Basil's Cathedral was finished construction, he was so pleased with the architect to reward him for such magnificent work, Ivan gouged his eyes out so that no one would ever design something so beautiful again. His paranoia also caused the slaughter of Novgorod, where after he was done claiming thousands of lives, he burned all the fields just for good measure. Wouldn't want all those dead people farming without your permission. Should we tell them about the other world monuments? Number six. Off with her head! Henry VIII is more well known for how he treated his wives more than his leadership. With a reign of over 20 years, the man had a few wives. Two of his wives were executed for ridiculous reasons, another was divorced. Turns out, actually, the church wouldn't grant that divorce he was looking for. So Henry went and did the next best thing. He broke away from the Catholic Church and dissolved the monasteries, taking their wealth and redistributing it as he saw fit. Nothing is unholier than trying to get away from the church. Historians believe that his divorce actually led to the English Reformation. Number five, nothing left. Alexander the Great was an excellent warrior for his time. Having conquered so much at a young age is really quite impressive. His empire stretched from Greece all the way to India. 
For a history class or a good book, this is fine, but in reality, he was a conqueror. The places he was marching into weren't exactly happy to have spear wielding visitors. He laid siege on multiple cities, executed those who defied him, and sold people into YouTube's least favorite S word. Just about checks off everything a guy needs to be considered a tyrant. History remembers his conquest, but I for sure will not forget how brutal conquerors can really be. Number 4 Chop Chop While Maximilian Robespierre was not a king in the monarch sense, he did hold a lot of political power in France when the political climate was quite messy. Plus, France was at war. But even messier than that is the way he dealt with citizens who were deemed anti revolution by sending them to the guillotine. Within a one year period, he sent 17,000 people to their dooms via the National Razor, or as it became to be known. He even began practicing deism, something he called the cult of the supreme being. And if you know your history, you know that you can't get away with that forever. And with some sweet poetic justice, Robespierre was sentenced to the guillotine. Number 3 All My Friends Are Dead Usually when people expire, the human thing to do is bury said lifeless human. It's just what we do. But apparently Ferdinand I of Naples did not get that memo, instead taking a page from Night of the Museum. No, this is not a cute comedy movie starring Ben Stiller, but in reality a complete horrifying nightmare. Ferdinand took the saying, keep your enemies close, a little too literally, as his favorite form of punishment was to mummify his enemies. Which let's face it, if he's a king, there's gonna be plenty. And he would like to display these mummies and what's probably the coolest place to be if you're into that weird goth stuff. He did keep some alive in the dungeon, but he much preferred his guests embalmed, where he would have them dressed up on display, just as they were before making the mistake of crossing Ferdinand. Now, what's the point of having that hardcore collection if you're not going to show it off? Well, he did. To the people he suspected of treason, which in a place like that, treason leaves your mind pretty quick. Number 2 Average Height for the Time Napoleon Bonaparte was one of the greatest military strategists of his time, maybe of all time. With full support of the French army, Napoleon found himself earning gallant victories one after another, all being accomplished at a very young age. However, after years of grand success in multiple wars and kicking a lot of imperial butt, it started to go to his head. Shortly after the coup that overthrew Robespierre, Napoleon had gained enough support to claim himself as the Emperor of France. With said power, dissolved the freedom of press, reduced the rights of women, and oh yeah, he was at war with most of Europe for years to come. While his military victories cannot be understated, his rise as a tyrannical dictator makes him very unholy. Number 1 Dracula There's been a lot of unholy things said here today, but old Vladdy takes the cake. What he lacked in land and power, he made up for in his brutality. As the legends go, Vlad was creative in his punishments, and was well noted for his human art pieces. And by art, I mean impaling his enemy on pikes, sometimes through their rear ends, and leaving them as warnings for anyone who dared cross him. Similar to the time, visiting envoys wouldn't remove their hats as it is to do in tradition, so Vlad had their hats nailed to their skulls, so that they may never remove them. There are a few other stories that are just too hot for YouTube, but I think he's a textbook example of unholy. He may also be the inspiration for Dracula. Imagine being that much of a monster one is created in your likeness. I mean, just looking at the painting of this guy, creeps me out, man. Whoa! Number 10 The Young Tsar. Being the leader of a nation is hard. I play a lot of city builders, trust me, I know. Being the leader of a nation whose people have been brutally oppressed by your family's dynasty for 300 years and in general living in very poor conditions, especially compared to the rest of the world, that's hard too. Even harder. Nicholas II inherited the throne from his father, which sounds great, but in reality was a lot of pressure to do so. As it turns out, Russia was in need of drastic change, and they would get it from the people and a bald man with very pointy facial hair. A communist revolution saw the empire of Russia fall, 300 years of Romanov rule end overnight, as the Tsar was forced to abdicate his throne. So what's his crime? Well, not doing anything. Negligence. He did so much nothing that people had to do something. Number 9 Nero Steam We've talked about Emperor Nero quite a lot on this channel, but that's because he's the down bad Roman Emperor who puts opulence in Pax Romana. It's hard to pinpoint an exact crime or moment from him, as he's the guy you think about when you think of Roman Emperors. However, his crimes against his wife Claudia Octavia are very notable. So when Nero was getting remarried, he had to get rid of Octavia. I mean, you can't, you can't have like 40 wives. Wait, that's, we gotta get rid of her. But how? 
I mean, how do you get rid of a woman like that? He actually did the whole uh, James Bond villain thing where the victim gets placed into a trap. Uh, it's very crude, but theatrical, because remember, that's theatrics are important. Remember that, folks. Hence, Octavia was banished to an island where shortly after she was locked into a vapor bath where she suffocated. Naturally, to make himself look better, uh, they made it look like uh, they made it look like she did it, not him. So yeah, what a great guy! What a what an absolute hero in that story. Definitely not a villain. Number eight, Abzal Khan. Everyone remembers King Henry VIII for doing what he did to his wives. A naughty slap on the wrist, naughty. Don't do that for shame. However, I would like to offer Abzal Khan as the alternative monster here. He, he didn't unalive a handful of wives like Henry. No, no. He actually managed to rack up a count of 63. Yep, you heard me right, 63. First off, I don't know how you have that many wives and or remember names, let alone birthdays and anniversaries. I would not do very well in that situation. Well, what's the reason for all this blood spilling? It's pretty horrible, actually. Simply because he was being invaded, and the guy who was invading him and winning was slightly nicer to women and was going to most likely give them a better life. Jeez, talk about if I can't have it, no one can. God. Number seven, food. Nice. Whether you like it or not, at some point in your life, you're gonna have to eat. And if you're like me, that means all the time. Steaks, ribs, beer, Burger King, pizza, pasta, ham, and chicken wings. Nice. It should be no surprise that I like beer and barbecue. And to answer your question, yes, I am the most fun guy to be around at the barbecue. Why? I, I just like to have fun and I like to eat good food, man. That, that's just it. Imagine a world, however, where there is no pizza and chicken wings. I know, it's horrible, right? Oh, food was always a concern of commoners in ancient times, and as much as I love meat, it wasn't always available. They just didn't live in the industrial agricultural world that we live in today. For Romans, it was a steady diet of breads and nuts, and if they were lucky, maybe some cheese or soup. But for the kings and emperors of old, well, if you feel like vomiting after all you can eat buffets, it makes you feel, you know, some first world kind of guilt, then look no further than ancient kings. Food might be the most excessive way they live, really. All kinds of meats all the time, beer, wine, fresh fruit and vegetables, which for health reasons is pretty huge, and to make them huge, maybe even some desserts. The Egyptians, for example, were known for their sweets. And now I'm hungry. We should go to a banquet together. Number six, 6,000 knights. Being a medieval knight, obviously, it sounds cool. They have the sword, the horse, the flowing hair, all that good stuff. They're saving the damsel in distress in some sort of tower. Well, no, it actually sucked being a knight at all. First of all, chainmail. You know how heavy chainmail is alone by itself? It's like 55 pounds. All that chainmail underneath your armor. No way, my body, this Q-tip spine would just break in half, no way. I can't even get on a horse wearing jeans and a shirt, let alone chain mail. Being a knight is something that starts when you're seven years old as well. You gotta start a little, little tot, a little royal tot. Then you'd be given to a noble to learn and be wise for seven years, some, you know, Yoda type scenario. And then at age 14, you become a squire, a knight's intern. Not an ideal job to have when you're 14, but if you stick it out, just seven more years, then you're an official ting ting. Knight, that's it. But then what? Do kings have two knights? Do they have four each? Is it like a breakdance squad? Is it like eights, groups of eights? Like, do we, how do we do this? Henry II of England could call up to 6,000 knights. This was back in the late 12th century. That's a lot of backup. That's a lot of shiny, majestical backup. My favorite knight still to this day, I don't care, Martin Lawrence. Jamal, Scott, I walk up. Happy up, what's up? Number five, big money. This is no surprise to anyone, I'm sure, but back in the day, I'd argue the division between wealth and poor was larger than today. Kings had it all. I mean, if you listen to what Taylor's saying, he, he knows what he's talking about. Food, water, power, what else is there? Well, how about the coinage to make it all happen? The bread, the guap, the dosh, and my favorite, the cheddar. Yes, that's right, the ancient king's wealth. Whatever they didn't already possess, they could take by force, or simply just bought with incalculable riches. With uncalculable riches. So much money, they had so much money. I can't make it clear, they had a lot of money. 
A great example of this was Mansa Musa, a very wealthy king from the Mali Empire. It's speculated he might have been the wealthiest person to ever walk the face of the earth. Earning his riches through the trading of gold and salt, he decided to show the international community how rich he was and went on tour, because that's just something you do when you have millions of dollars, I guess. Where in multiple cities, he spent and gave away so much gold that it upset the city's economies. That is, that is, a, that is a big flex, okay. Donald Trump might have hotels, but Mansa Musa has everything else. It's kind of like Monopoly, when one player has a boatload of cash and they go from one good property to the next. So you know if they land on something, they get all the cold hard. So you know if they land on something, they get all the cold hard cash to deal with it. Plus, they also have some good property, and they just make it back every turn anyway. I'm fed up with Monopoly. Number four, King of Castles. King Ludwig II had numerous castles built to resemble fairy tale castles. Yeah, let's call this inspiration, I guess. What a privilege this ought to be. Ludwig was only 18 when he became the King of Bavaria back in 1864. And then he had castles built as, you know, he was inspired from romantic literature and spending time at the opera. You hear that, Andrew? He was inspired after the opera. What a poet. It's crazy. Crazy. Must be nice, right? King Ludwig II would spend his nights in one castle, looking through his fancy telescope, admiring the next castle being built. What a, what? Who, ha? He even freestyled the castle as well. Yeah, just four years in, the guy designed his own majestical castle. And to this day, it's one of the most photographed places in the world, so clearly he did something right. New Schwinstein Castle, literal fairy tale. There we go. Meanwhile, I'm over here making castles in Minecraft. Still fun, we'll take it. Number three, jousting. First there is bread, and then there is wine, and then there is entertainment. You can't tell me why a delicious plate of nachos dances like a ballerina in your microwave, you didn't pull up some super cool content to watch on your phone. Maybe featuring a large, kind of funny comedian, and maybe also featuring a super handsome, tall, funny comedian with a neck thing, I don't know. Kings of ye olde times did not possess the power of the internet or watching fail videos, so watching combat sports was the next best thing. Oh, what's that I hear? Watching the sport isn't enough? Well, some royalty even got involved. King Henry VIII, for example, just loved to joust because because he did. He even had an accident with such, and it's what might have made him gone mad in the first place. Number two, banning coffee. This is the worst of the worst, people. Here we go. Murad IV, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. The guy banned coffee. What a monster. I would be asleep right now if coffee wasn't a thing. He was born in 1612, and for the most part, his mother was ruling through him because he was so young and all. But when he got a little older, he got a little wiser, he put forth these laws, punishable by death, may I add, in order to get things back on track. That was the key. The guy banned coffee, tobacco, and alcohol. What a, what a fun guy. He would actually disguise himself as a civilian at nighttime and then wander around aimlessly in hopes that he would find one of these dark roast renegades just wandering the roads. If you were caught outside having a quick smoke break, you weren't arrested, you didn't get fined, but rather Murad IV himself would just take off his hood and be like, surprise, and then he would take off your head. Right there in the streets. No trial, no jury, just straight to execution. All that for some stale ale. What a monster. Number one, groom of the stool. For some reason, this job was considered to be higher up, a well-respected job, if you will. However, I'd like to ask the man in charge of such an operation how he felt. Imagine, I can imagine he wasn't too fond of his job. Hands never clean, hands never clean. The groom of the stool is someone who would assist the king in his bathroom duties by supplying fresh water, towels, and whatever a king needs. He may have also been responsible for cleaning the forbidden starfish. May the divines of Skyrim have mercy on his soul. I guess this had to be done, but I don't know if I could ever even do that to another human being. If you've ever eaten Taco Bell late at night and washed it down with some Baja Blast, then you know the kind of explosion awaits the porcelain throne in the morning. So yes, having a servant present at your bowel movements is a privilege that most other folks just didn't have, but would you really want one? Number 10, King Charles I. You can put any king down on this list, really. Uh, people weren't as kind and loving as we are now. Or, or well, less cruel, I guess. <laughs> king Charles was no different from any other. A monarch sniffing his own farts up in his castle, doing his very best to snuff out religious groups that he didn't agree with. A lot of guys were like that. It's brutal, but that's history, folks. Well, one such measure he took, I think, was so wrong, so heinous, and so criminal, and so offensive, that he should have been locked up for life. During the 1600s, this man, in an effort to curb religious views, outlawed Christmas. Yeah, that's right. Outlawed Christmas. That means no gifts, no tree, no Santa Claus, no turkey, no stuffing, no nothing. 
This was quickly dissolved after he was removed from office. And yes, I know Santa Claus wasn't there then, but st it's still, it's Santa Claus, it's Christmas. Can't have Christmas without Santa Claus. Number nine, William the Conqueror. You've all probably heard the name William the Conqueror. Battle of Hastings, illegitimate son of the king fighting for the throne. Very violently too, I might add. However, today I want to talk about his dating skills. Look, dating can be hard. I, I get that. There's a lot of anxiety, especially when self-image comes into play. Ooh, I'm too fat. I hate my nose. And what are these legs? Ugh, no one's gonna like me. Everyone thinks like that. And it's always usually right before a date, too. You could be staring in the mirror, and then all of a sudden all your bruises, pimples, and blemishes seem to show up out of nowhere. It's weird how that works. Well, William was different though. He, he was more confident. He didn't have confidence issues like the rest of us. To quote a brilliant chemist, he was the one who knocks. As the story goes, he was quite fond of one lass. She was not fond of him. Classic story, really. So after trying to court her several times and failing, he decided to drag her on the ground by her hair until she said yes. Don't, don't do that, that's, that's bad. Number eight, Kangas Khan. I don't think some folks realize just how brutal this guy really was. I mean, if you've ever played the Ghost of Tsushima game on PlayStation, then you know exactly what the Mongol horde is capable of. Nossy things. The man carved out most of Asia and parts of Europe. In one battle allegedly taking the lives of one million people. And all that remained was a mountain of bones and human fat. Ooh, gross. He's been known on how not to treat a lady and reportedly liked to use his young and newest soldiers as arrow fodder by creating human shields with them. A lot of conscripts in his army were often taken from villages and he conquered. It's kind of how he kept the machine going. So either fight with me or that's picture app for you. What a nice guy. What a swell nice guy. Jeez. Since that highly debated viral clip was mentioned, I'll make the next point about how gratitude is implied. Which it's most definitely not. I don't see a lot of gratitude coming from royal families. There is endless videos and pictures of these sour faced monarchs harassing and devaluing the endless service they have accompanying them. Let me hit y'all with an iconic example. Have you seen Downton Abbey? Most folks have. Have you ever noticed one of their royal or aristocratic characters ever say thank you to their servant? No? And that's an intentional detail, as it's been a long since unspoken, at least in British monarchy, that servants are best unthanked and unheard. Now, Alistair Bruce in the BTS documentary about the TV show series explained his perspective, that the servants did everything for their masters, and if thanks were given, it would be necessary to say them at least 60 times a day. That would be, as the English say, tiresome. It does stand that servants are not required to be thanked no matter if they just hide your shoe or wipe your ass, you as a royal have the right to just scoff and point and expect results. But at least one royal who can't verbally berate you is the revered royal pets. Multiple royal houses and their respective rulers have decided to use these rules and servants to treat their pets as an extension of themselves. By personifying them, even just trimming a corgi's nails too short could get you proverbially beheaded and definitively fired. Some famous examples of royals who have servants service their pets are Queen Elizabeth II staged a funeral for a chameleon and an Indian ruler Muhammad Mahaba Khan threw a lavish elaborate wedding for his dog. Louis of France took being a cat person to a whole other level and basically turned Vassals into a giant breeding ground. Charles II of England issued a royal law that his iconic King Charles Spaniels, which are obviously named after him, have license to walk anywhere in the kingdom without harassment, even parliament. And of course, who can forget Caligula, who appointed his favorite horse, Icaritas, as an official senator. But I'd have to say, I imagine there's not much worse than food tasting. Normally, you'd be able to think this wouldn't be so bad. Wrong, let me make it worse. So obviously, they're tasting it for poison and other tricky little substances that could be take down a king. What if the soup was laced with arsenic? How easy is it to slip into the kitchen and lace the king's food with belladonna or hemlock? The food tester was always a servant or sometimes even a slave or a prisoner. And if you think about those status of those people, well, they were eating mush flour and bone broth and then calling it a day. Given the opportunity to be a food taster means the literal taste of luxury. The only effed part is the first bite of flavorful rice you're ever going to eat in your life, you're going to immediately die, maybe. It'd be enough for you to put off eating any meal you didn't prepare yourself, and there'd be no way of knowing if the food was deadly until you've after you've eaten it. In 1594, there was a plot to poison Queen Elizabeth, apparently the King of Spain, as the Spanish were enemies of England at the time. A group of Portuguese men had agreed to carry out the dirty work, including the Queen's own food 
physician Rodrigo Lopez. Once the plot was uncovered, all men were executed. And it's not just our ancient royals that brought people on to do this task. Naturally, President Putin has a food taster as part of his security team. No hoovering, which is British for don't vacuum. In 2011, Royal Servants was uploaded to YouTube, a documentary that gave insight into what it's like working for the royal family, including accounts from former butlers, chefs, nannies, and footmen. To quote the narrator, the best servant is one that is neither seen nor heard. The royal family demands the most professional servants in the world, the kind of servants that would rather die than make a mistake. She continues on in this not pretentious at all breakdown, saying that behind the scenes, butlers lay out clothes, footmen carry early morning trays, and cleaners sweep carpets, lest royal ears are offended by vacuum cleaners? One rule cleaners must follow is that they have to sweep the floors instead of hoovering them, because the sound may be too loud, especially in the early morning. I don't know if you guys have seen these palaces, but they're about 110% red carpet, and it's not that cheap kind. This stuff probably holds on to dirt the way your homie holds on to their cheating ex. Not being permitted to use such modern inventions makes their job not even a little, but a lot more difficult. Immensely. They have to quite literally sweep the carpets, the most ineffective way to clean a carpet that's tacked into the ground. And they're already being held at a higher standard than really any other servant on earth. But don't forget, after you're done measuring the carrots, you feed the horses and sweeping a carpet, you also have to kiss the linens. Whichever unfortunate servant was tasked with making Henry VIII's bed after he woke up in the morning was then required to kiss every part of the linen to prove he hadn't smeared poison on them. What? Don't get me wrong, Henry was like intensely and increasingly paranoid. You can go check my recent video, Top 10 King Henry VIII Facts You Never Knew, to learn more about his whole mess. But anyways, someone screws the pooch. Pretty sure it's Ambroise Parch, the 16th century French royal physician who once wrote, now poisons do not only kill being taken into the body, but some being put or applied outwardly. And now this delusional hypochondriac finds out the poison can sink in through his skin, not just be ingested, and he insists on this gross ritual. In an era where sheets don't get washed, and he doesn't wash, and he's all sweaty and gouty, and banging tons of biddies in that bed. Imagine having to kiss those sheets every morning. That's the real poison. RIP, dude. Mint essence oil under the nose, and I'm just praying for you. When the standard of hygiene is so low, your only request is that X marks the spot. Eleanor Harmon, the author of The Royal Art of Poison, says royal palaces, some courtiers don't even bother to look for a chamber pot, but just drop their britches and did their business. All of their business. All of it. All of it. In the staircases, the hallways, or the fireplaces. In Versailles, women just pulled up their skirts to pee where they stood, and some men urinated off the balustrade in the middle of the royal chapel. The smelly truth is that Hampton Court, that of Henry VIII, was not well equipped to serve the bodily needs of hundreds upon hundreds of hundreds of servants. During the king's boisterous banquets, busy servants regularly needed the call of nature, so they relieved themselves in hidden hallways corridors or on sizzling fireplaces that were cooking the food. I, I need a minute with that one. Anyways, the walls reeked of urine so badly that according to historian Lucy Worsley in her book If Walls Could Talk, the palace management would have had crosses chalked into the walls with the hope that people would be reluctant to desecrate a religious symbol. That's right. While servants were always encouraged to pee in vats, oh you know, so their urine could be used to clean later, to keep servants and courtiers from urinating on the garden walls, Henry had large crosses painted in problem spots, I guess. But instead of deterring men from relieving themselves, what it did was literally give them a target. To fix the problem, Henry VIII then realized he had to make bathrooms. So he constructed a giant toilet block by the River Thames called the Great House of Easement. And of course, last but not least, fresh out the kitchen of Henry VIII is Dee's Roasted Chestnuts. King Henry VIII's kitchen at Hampton Court Palace was one of the largest kitchens in Europe. And obviously, it would have had to be to service the banquets of grandeur I was just talking about. There were huge wood fireplaces producing an average of 800 to 1,000 meals in a day, courtesy of just a mere 200 cooks. Naturally, that amount of ovens and that amount of cooks in the kitchen, yeah, it's downright cozy. And the average of 1.3 million logs were burnt, creating a hellish atmosphere, leaving the cooks drained and drenched in sweat. From roasting meats to boiling,
boiling cauldrons, the kitchen of Henry VIII was no less than passing as the underworld. So what happened in all this heat, dare say? Did they crack a window? Did they get some ice? Take a smoke break, maybe? Nah, the cooks just took off all their clothes to tolerate the temperature while it's cooking. Just to reiterate, all their clothes, all of them. But alas, the atrocities were never ending for these men, as King Henry VIII issued an order to stop being naked or in garments of such vileness as they do now, nor lie in the nights and days in the kitchen or the ground by the fireside. To combat the problem, clerks of the kitchen were instructed to purchase honest and wholesome garments for the staff. And guess what that was? There's a reason the apron covers the front. But kicking off the list at number 10, must love licorice. Okay, we'll start off a little tame. Napoleon Bonaparte, the famous French emperor, the famous military leader from the 1800s. Napoleon Bonaparte was responsible for conquering a large part of Europe. Bet you didn't know he was obsessed with licorice though. Way too much, he would eat this all day, every day. Ugh, feels gross. Look, as somebody who can't stand licorice, I already feel bad for Josephine. Licorice breath at any time of the day coming your way? No, no thank you, I'll hard pass. Napoleon carried licorice around with him at all times. This guy ate so much of it, his teeth became stained. They turned black. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, it's black licorice too. Not the strawberry pull and peels, those are great. I'm talking about 1800s black licorice. It would come in lozenges. If somebody offered me a lozenge and it was black licorice, I'd call the police. Smack it out of their hands. Number nine, George IV. When it was time for King George III to pass on the crown, of course, next in line, heir to the throne, is his eldest son, also named George. What if you became king in 1820? Would you be noble? Would you do monologues in the sunset as you enriched your homeland? Kings like to do that a lot with their off oh, by the hair still. Or would you do what King George IV did and make horrible financial decisions every single day? The guy would just party all day as well. He would gamble every day, he would buy expensive stuff that he did not need. And on top of that, he would never do any of his royal duties. Guy wouldn't do his job. His father had to step in, classic. He figured the only way to settle all these new debts set in motion by George IV. In order to clear those up, George now has to marry his cousin, Caroline of Brunswick. The arranged marriage happened on April 8th, 1795, and what was supposed to be a happy day for all was a nightmare for all included. They hated each other as soon as they met. I mean, obviously, he was a fool. George got heavily intoxicated for the wedding. He was just hammered the entire time. And then nine months later, almost to the day, they had a child. And then right after that happened, they went their separate ways. So yeah, horribly unhealthy relationship. Once George became king in 1820, he then tried to divorce her. Like, what a fool, just let it go, let it all go, let her go. Number eight, Filippo Maria Visconti. The Duke of Milan during the 14th century was at first Gian Maria Visconti, but after he was taken out, his brother, Filippo Maria Visconti, had to step up to the bat. As a ruler, Filippo was better. His brother had been cruel previously, hence the untimely departure. So this was a good move at first, so we thought. Now Filippo had to take over come 1412. Filippo was better than his brother on paper. He helped reorganize government finances. He got the silk industry up and running, which we love that. He ended up passing away of natural causes down the road, which is, you know, nothing like his brother. But while he was in power, he never showed his face to anybody, not even people close to him. He hid in his palace most of the time, and it was odd because he thought that he was ugly. That's why he hid his face. Kind of sad, right? Filippo hid his face, and maybe you feel bad for him now, right? Just a little bit. He died of natural causes, and he was alone all that time. Yeah, don't feel bad for him. This guy was horrible. He was jealous of his wife Beatrice Lascaris de Tenda because she was twice his age, twice as smart, and twice as powerful. So, Filippo had her taken out in a courtyard publicly September 13th, 1418. Yeah, he accused her of adultery just cause, cause he could and he had some suspicions in his dark room by himself hiding his face. History is ugly and sometimes it's literally ugly as well. Number seven, Elvis Presley. Lots of similarities today. Elvis Presley, before Michael Jackson, he was probably the most famous person to ever exist. The king of rock and roll, baby, that's right. All I'll say is phone your grandma and ask her how she feels about him. She probably says she loves his music and those gyrating hips. At the time, it was pretty controversial. Boy, only if they knew what was going on today. Whew. Sorry, 50s Atomic families. Well, being that Elvis Presley was the king and the first celebrity to be idolized the way we do with modern celebrities, he became quite wealthy. Well, with all that money, he bought some weird things, including a chimp. Everyone's buying a monkey, they want a zoo, I don't know. A mansion property he named Graceland and pink Cadillac for his mother, and strangely enough, he bought FDR's yacht. Yeah, what? That's so weird. 
Good president, sure, but does it really have room for a monkey in a pink Cadillac? I don't know. Number six, French royalty. This one is more about Marie Antoinette and King Louis XVI. It's kind of like a two-pack, kind of like a couple, but trust me, it all makes sense in the end. Uh, but it, again, and anything they bought, it was probably the king's wallet, wasn't it? Okay, so when your country is starving, demanding more rights, and in general, life really sucks, what's the next best thing you do? Buy a $12 million necklace. Yeah, right, okay, I've said that before, sure. Okay, Chad, what else? Continue to live your opulent life on the kings and people's dimes. Sure, why not? It makes sense, okay. I'm talking too much. Well, something I learned today and something that Taylor showed me is that I guess the last Queen of France was a little lonely. So what did King Louis do to fix this? Spend more time with her? Nay. Buy her a new dog? Nay, sir and madams. He had her pug from Austria imported to the country. And anyone can tell you that when something is imported, you are going to be dishing out a few more dosh. Yes, that's right. They imported her pug from Austria. Imagine how that sounds when your house is literally falling apart, you're starving, and you pay the most taxes. Makes you want to put heads on pikes. That's what it makes you want to do. Can you imagine that? We're all poor and hungry. She's like, well, look at my dog. It's my dog. They're French, they don't sound like that, but this is my dog, look at my dog, here he is. <laughs> Number five, King of Egypt. His Majesty Farouk I, by the grace of God, King of Egypt and the Sudan, that was his full title, was disposed during his nation's 1952 revolution and spent the remainder of his days in exile to Italy. In his haste to avoid getting the Mussolini treatment, he left behind a majority of his most prized possessions. When the people got a look at what he was uh, storing behind the walls of his residence, they were a bit disgusted to find an excessive number of expensive suits, rare stamps and coins, jewels, luxury vehicles and many other things that I will never afford. Now, what else would he have that would be considered strange? I'll let you take a guess. Was it A, a blam blam cachet? B, piles and piles of a white substance that made the 80s fun? Or C, an unsettling amount of gardening magazines? Go ahead and let us know in the comments below. I'll give you a second. Mm -hmm. Do, 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 do. Nope, time's up. If you said secret option D, you'd be right. What was it, you ask? Well, it was a disturbing amount of adult entertainment. So much so, it wouldn't even fit underneath his mattress. Man, that's, that's a lot. That's too much. That's too much. Number four, Peter the Third. Remember the last time you played with your toys as a kid? Same. And let us know what your favorite toys were as a kid. Let's see if we have some shared favorites. I'm actually curious. That's kind of a cool thing to talk about. Well, for Peter the Third, it was little army men, or tin soldiers, I guess you'd call them. And yes, he played with them as an adult, staging mock battles. Is it the weirdest thing ever? No, it's not. But he was a king, so that's a wee bit strange. Hey, I love army men just as much as the next guy, especially those little green plastic dudes. I used to love those video games too. Very underrated in my opinion. I love that stuff. It also makes me think of that scene in Spaceballs. Enough references aside, you never really know someone until you've seen the money they've spent on their army men collection. Number three, Ibrahim the First. Fur, fur everywhere. Abram I of the Ottoman Empire was the 18th Sultan and the number one purchaser of fine furs. Personally, I've never had any fine furs. I grew up in the trailer park and mama always said that fur was cruel anyway, so I never felt the luxury of uh, fine furs, if you will. It must be nice because Ibram loved them so much. Like, he really, really loved them. His whole wardrobe consisted of them, in fact. Plus, his walls were covered in them, and apparently even his curtains. I don't do well in heat, so I'll pass on that. I'd be sweating way too much. Too much fur. Number two, the locksmith. Who are you and how'd you get in here? I'm the locksmith and uh, I'm the locksmith. Classic Leslie Nielsen. God, I love that guy. I love those movies. I'd love to make one one day. We're starring one. Hollywood, call me. King Louis XVI, the last king of France. We're back to him again. The man spent his time and money on something rather strange. No, not all was spent on his wife and her life. And yeah, I'm kind of putting him on the list twice, but trust me, it's weird. I mean, come on. He gave the queen whatever the heck she wanted. Well, apparently he loved to spend his time and money on locksmithing. What? Yeah, that's so weird. He would spend his time trying to get into locks and understand them. He was also stated as saying that every man should have a passion. Hey, maybe put down the locks and start helping the people as a passion. There's an idea. What a great idea. Feed the people. Instead, I'm just going to work on this lock. I'm just going to go ahead and just, yeah. Oh, 
Almost got it. Yep. Number one, Christian the Seventh of Denmark. I saw this and I just, I just had to put it on here. I mean, come on. Apparently, the guy wasn't very mentally stable. I mean, who is these days? Apparently, the royal spent a lot of his time uh, waxing his carrot, polishing the flagpole, tenderizing the gabagoo, charming the snake, uh, self-firing on all cylinders, the one-handed bedroom dance. Uh, what I did all summer long in high school. You get the point, okay? You understand what I'm trying to say. Truth of the matter is, you don't get there with a little help from Vaseline or St. Ives. The man bought time so he could be this way. The man is either a legend or a crazy person. Imagine having that much money and that much time in your day that that's all you do. At number 10, some background. The Mughal dynasty in India was founded by Babur, a descendant of the one, the only, Genghis Khan and Tamerlane. After he defeated a sultan of Delhi named Ibrahim Lodi in 1526, Babur was the first step in the Mughal dynasty that would last for over three centuries. To say that the empire was immense is an understatement. The empire ruled over 103 million people, probably even more. The Mughals were rooted in Muslim beliefs and were noted for their well organized government and cultural sophistication. Many of the rulers tried to integrate the Hindus and Muslims under one state, but as we will find out from this list, it was not an easy thing to do, which ended up causing a lot of strife. Many rulers of the empire flip flopped back and forth between being merciful and tyrannical towards the Hindus, adding to centuries of oppression. At number 9, Blinded. Humayun was set to inherit the throne from his father, much to the jealousy of his brothers. He was 23 when he ascended the throne in 1530 after the death of his father. His brothers reigned over different fiefs, but none of them were satisfied unless they had the crown. He also wasn't the best ruler. Humayun was sent into exile for 15 years after he was overthrown by one of his father's generals, Sher Shah. Humayun fled and eventually ended up in Persia where he built back up an army through his partnership with the Shah. Slowly, he took back his land, facing his own brothers who were constantly scheming against him. But Babur, his father, made him promise that he would never lay a hand on his brothers. But his brother Kamran continued to threaten him, and one instance while defending a fort turned on the innocents trapped inside and took their lives viciously. Kamran, not a good dude. Something needed to be done. He eventually catches his scheming brothers, blinds his brother Cameron, and chains his brother Askari. A little messed up, but like, you know, not bad for war. Before I carry on with the rest of the video, make sure you guys are subscribed to the channel and maybe consider leaving a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far. At number 8, Akbar. Humayun continued to deal with the competition of his brothers until finally his reign came to an end, but not in the way that you would expect. He was carrying a bunch of books up some stairs and he accidentally fell, leading to a lethal head injury. His 13 year old son Akbar had to inherit the throne. Akbar would later become known as the Great, but that doesn't mean that he didn't do some questionable things. Where his father failed to conquer, Akbar swept through. But just like his father, he encountered jealousy and dangerous ambition in the dark corners of his reign. In Delhi, an attempt to assassinate him was made, the bowman nearly missing him. Who was behind it? The slave of a nobleman who recently tried to start a rebellion. But the plot thickens. Akbar's foster brother's mother had further designs to establish power for herself through her son, Adam Khan. Khan actually ended up taking the life of Akbar's foster father, which led to Akbar throwing him down the stairs and therefore killing him. The mother died 40 days later due to grief. Grief over her son or the loss of power? Who knows? Number 7. Party Hard Zhu Huzhao was the emperor of the Ming Dynasty in the early 1500s. Now lately we've been talking about kings and queens, we're on part 2's for both now, and there's a good amount who simply just aren't ready, they're too young to rule. Like Joffrey from Game of Thrones, kings like that actually existed, they were horrible. They were young, they were too young to know what was right and wrong. Plus they usually have some corrupt parents whispering in their ears the entire time. Zhu took the throne at just age 14, and for a while, ministers were confident that he would grow into the role and become the leader that he was born to be. Well, when he got older, he transformed a zoo just outside of Beijing. He transformed it into his own personal brothel. Yum. I mean, on one hand, I'm glad the animals are free, but like a zoo, you couldn't find a more romantic place. Can convert an Applebee's to a brothel, maybe? I don't know, something with AC. His final days were spent partying and some would say a little bit too hard. He got intoxicated and fell from a boat. That's how he ended his life. Honestly, not a bad way to go out. Pretty OG. 
At number six, love game. A lot of kings and queens throughout history have been known to engage in the horizontal hustle a lot. I mean, when you're a ruler of a kingdom, you don't really have much to do in your spare time. So what else are you gonna do? Play a board game? No. These monarchs were getting busy all the time, but there was one king who was just so obsessed with getting a good old pickle tickle that it just became his whole personality. King Philip V was known to be a nymphomaniac, and he liked doing the deed a lot, but because at the time, the Catholic Church said that having sexy time with anyone but your spouse was a sin, the king and his wife were getting busy all the time. Eventually his first wife caught on to how to use this to her advantage and she would often refuse to sleep with him until she got her way with anything she suggested or demanded from him. You would think that he would catch on to this game, but maybe his urges were just so strong because he always caved and gave her what he wanted. Obviously this man did not follow Hoodville. Absolutely not. Just to give you guys an idea of how obsessed this guy was, when his wife was on her deathbed, before she went eh, he literally tried to get one last bang in. On her deathbed. Like dude, not the time. Number five, George V. We love hobbies here on Bumblebee. I mean, I used to collect special quarters growing up. I swear to God, the only time I've ever been good at saving money was when I was 12. I would see one of these and be like, mm, don't touch it. George V turned out he loved stamps. A lot, like a lot, a lot. Since he was a wee young lad, he was collecting these little guys. Here's the unusually impressive part about him though and his hobby, he continued to collect stamps during World War I. This guy was busy, everybody's trying to stay alive and George is just licking stamps in the library like a prince. Like all collections, it started at an early age and now it's at the point where it's past impressive and it's just borderline strange. This guy had albums on albums of stamps. He had around 330 albums, each with 60 pages full of stamps. Quick maths, that's like 20,000 pages full of stamps. So naturally he was nicknamed the king of stamps, or rather the king of philately, the official term for collecting stamps. It's a nice word. Philately. Philately. Back in 1905 he set an all time stamp record, which I didn't even know that was the thing, and it was the most money ever spent on a single stamp. The guy dropped like 220,000 US on a single stamp. Somebody even asked the prince down the road if he had heard about this idiot who spent 1400 pounds on a stamp, and he was proud of it. He was like, that was me, that was me, you wanna see it? The next King George is a little different to say the least. At number four, Womanizer. I'm going to preface this by saying that George IV of England was voted as England's worst king by historians, so that should already tell you a lot about this guy. Georgie here was yet another one of those monarchs who was a little too invested in his intimate conquests, you know? Now we do know that the encounters that he was on were all consensual, so that's a plus. However, he was still creepy about it, yeah. This man tried everything to get a woman to sleep with him, he would throw a tantrum if she said no, or threaten to end his life if he didn't get to do the eight-legged nature dance, you know? Somehow, this had a pretty good success rate, even though he was not a catch at all. It feels like this was one of those situations where you kinda just give in to make him stop talking, you know? Anyways, this guy was super creepy, because on top of the lengths that he would go to just to get some time in the sack, he also kept trophies of his conquests. He would ask each of the people he slept with for a lock of their hair, and he kept them all. Back then, it was kind of common for lovers to keep locks of each other's hair, but George's collection was alarming because of just how many locks of hair there were. After the king died, his brothers found 7,000 envelopes, each with a lock of hair that was, quote, enough to stuff a sofa, end quote. Fun fact, if you want to see this insane collection, it is in a museum in Scotland, so check that out if you want, I guess. Number three, kleptomania part two. On our spoiled queens list, Brie mentioned Queen Mary and how she just couldn't stop stealing, which is hilarious to me, just this old lady stealing your well, the last king of Egypt also had sticky fingers. He was even better at it too. Check this out. Farouk I was the youngest son of Egypt's first king, Fouad I. Now, born in 1920 in Alexandria and in his early days at school, he couldn't concentrate. The king sent him to England even after to hopefully find a better way of teaching, something that works for him, but still it was to no avail. Once the king passed away in 1936, Farouk then got the throne, but also, so much property and so much money. He had hundreds of fancy cars, 75,000 acres of land. This guy had it all. Literally, he had anything he could think of, but still, he felt like he needed to take more, to steal. At 17 years old, he would slam 12 eggs for breakfast and then wash it down with 30 bottles of beer. Nutritious and delicious. 
horrible. On top of the fact that he loved to steal, he was the biggest hoarder. So he had thousands of shirts, randomly. He also had 50 diamond studded walking sticks for some reason, and like a prince such as myself, he too collected coins. I mean, his collection was much nicer, but still, great minds think alike. Spoiled minds think alike, rather. Oh shit, this is eye-opening. One of the most bizarre facts about Farouk was he pickpocketed Winston Churchill once. He took the guy's watch. After everything I just said, he still decided to steal his watch. What a gem. We love him. Yeah. At number two, the king of pettiness. Let's talk about a ruler that the Indian state of Alwar has described as controversial. If his own people are calling him controversial, then you know something's up. And boy, you better strap in because you're in for a wild ride with this one. Maharaja Jai Singh was pretty eccentric in a pretty dark way. He was known to have a temper and act on impulse, and he did some very questionable and downright scary things. He was known to be very competitive and hated to lose. One time, while playing polo, he and his team lost, and so in retaliation, he blamed the horse he was using and made the horse get extra crispy. He uh, fired his horse. I'm sure you know where I'm going by that. If not, use your noodle, I don't know. Unfortunately, the cruelty towards living things didn't stop at animals, and he was also known to kidnap women from the streets and go all criminal minds on them. On a slightly lighter note, though, the Maharaja was also known to be very petty. Once he went into a Rolls Royce dealership, and the person working there thought that he was broke and ignored him. Thinking that this was insanely rude, he bought seven Rolls Royces, sent them back to India, and used them to pick up garbage. This guy was really just doing the absolute most. And coming in at our number one spot, King Ludwig II. Home renovation shows rock my world. I can watch Love It or List It for months at a time. It's the dream, building your own home one day. And if you're a king, well, it's pretty easy to get that done. In our Spoiled Queens part two, I mentioned a princess that had a house made of ice, literal ice. Well, King Ludwig II had numerous castles built to resemble fairy tales, literally like, fairy tales. I gotta admit, I kind of love this a lot. Ludwig was only 18 when he became the king of Bavaria in 1864, and then he had castles, like castles, more than one, built after he was inspired from romantic literature and spending some time at the opera. The kid was a dreamer, you gotta love it. He would spend his nights in one castle looking through a telescope at his new castle being built. So he would just watch it all night. That's like the king's way of waiting for your Amazon delivery. Just standing there, just like, it's coming. 17 years and it's done. Just four years in, he designed his own castle and to this day, it's one of the most photographed places in the world. Neutrenstein Castle. Go check it out. It's literally a paradise. Fatal herbs. Ying Zeg was born in China in 259 BC. Declared himself King Shi Huang, or the first emperor of the Qi dynasty, at age 38. He reportedly proclaimed that his dynasty would last 10,000 generations and wanted to be around long enough to see that prediction come true. Pretty difficult for the average human, especially in 259 BC, to live that long, so in order to make it happen, he needed to be immortal. According to the news agency, See Xinhua 2017 analysis of 2,000 year old texts dating to the emperor's rule shows his obsessive quest for an elixir that would bring him eternal life. A researcher discovered texts pertaining to an executive order issued by Qin Shi Huang demanding his subjects search for something that can keep him alive forever. He believed in an old myth that there were three spirit mountains in the sea inhibited by mortals. He used his soldiers to look for herbs and such that would grant him immortality and then drink them as elixirs. Unfortunately, Shi Huang did not find the correct elixir and passed away 11 years later at 49. Turns out a lot of these elixirs were often made by alchemists and had traces of mercury in them, which is suspected to have caused his demise. At number 9, body parts. In the 17th century, dead body parts called mummai were often sold to apothecaries and physicians. Why would they need body parts, you ask? Well, in those days, many believed that these parts contained some form of life force left over from the person, thus containing healing powers for medicine. When it came to royalty back then, living a long life was the goal, so in order to have the best chance at healing, royalty was often prescribed mumia, made of a healthy person or a young person. The medicine could be ingested by swallowing or rubbing it on an injury. So basically, royalty was paying for crushed up people so they could eat them or rub them into their skin. They had so much faith in mumia that it was believed to be able to treat serious ailments like coughs and epilepsy. Some of the royals who believed in the method were King Charles II and King William II of England. England, 
Francois I of France, Christian IV of Denmark. The medicine was in such high demand back then that some even took to digging up Egyptian graves and tomb robbing them for valuable bodies. The practice luckily died out in the 18th century. At number 8, Lavish Horse Stable. Gazius Caesar Augustus Germasius, better known by his nickname Caligula, was the third Roman emperor ruling from 37 to 41 AD. Caligula was described as an insane emperor who was self absorbed and short tempered, taking lives on a whim and indulging in too much spending and engaging in affairs. Apparently, he was accused of sleeping with other men's wives and then bragging about it and taking lives just for the fun of it. One thing Caligula did love was his horse, Incitatius, who he would feed regular treats to and even paid for a stable to be made out of marble. Soldiers were even ordered to hush the neighborhood if the horse was asleep. Caligula also deliberately wasted money constructing a two mile floating bridge so that he and his horse could gallop along it. There was already a financial crisis going on, so the bridge money led to citizens starving. Probably the craziest idea he had was that he planned to appoint his horse to the high office of consul, but luckily for his people, he was assassinated before he was able to do so. At number seven, kissing sheets. For thousands of years, monarchs worried about the threat of being poisoned by their enemies, and so they thought of an array of precautions to take in order to prevent being taken out by some kind of spicy death sauce or something. Many monarchs hired tasters to try their food before it was given to the king to make sure that it wasn't poisoned, but some monarchs were also afraid of being poisoned through something that they touched. This is why Henry VIII hired someone with a very important job to make sure that his bed wasn't poisoned. The person who was tasked with making the king's bed was also required to kiss every part of his bed in the morning. They would kiss the pillows, sheets, and blankets to prove that someone hadn't smeared poison on it. The king was also concerned with people poisoning clothing too, so his clothes as well as his son's clothes were also tested for poison before getting dressed. At number 6, Eternal Youth. I know that there are a lot of people out there who want to live forever. I am one of those people. I am afraid of dying, but I also want to see what humanity will look like many, many years from now until the sun consumes the earth. Unfortunately, that's kind of impossible, at least for now, until we come up with some kind of way to make people live longer. But this idea of prolonging your life has been around for thousands of years, and one Chinese emperor was super obsessed with the idea and really tried his best to live for at least another 10,000 years. Emperor Ying Zhang was obsessed with finding a magic elixir that would make him live longer, and he demanded that his subjects find this immortality elixir for him. Now, even though he brought a lot of prosperity to people during his rule, he never let go of his demand for immortality, and it put a lot of pressure on his underlings to find him something to help him live forever, but obviously that didn't happen. He was so concerned with his lifespan that he even brought magicians into his court. His obsession alienated him from his people, and after all, all of that effort trying to live longer, he died at the age of 49. At number 5, no bathing. These days, bathing is kind of a necessary thing. You gotta be clean, you have to smell nice, you have to practice proper hygiene. But back in the olden days, this was the complete opposite and nobles rarely ever bathed and it was kind of a trend. Over time, physicians began to believe that bathing was dangerous and obviously the nobility tried to protect their lives and well-being at all costs and so they just stopped bathing. In a popular 16th century medical book, it was advised, quote, use not baths or stews nor sweat too much. For all openeth pores of a man's body, maketh the venomous air to open and for to infect the blood. End quote. So, yeah, they thought that taking a bath would make you sick. In the late 15th century, Queen Isabella of Spain would go around bragging about the fact that she had only ever bathed twice in her whole life. Weird flex, but okay. King James IV apparently never bathed, and his hygiene was so bad that he passed on lice to other people who went into a room that was frequented by the king. He also never washed his hands before eating and would just rub his fingers with the wet end of a napkin. These people were gross. At number four, prankster king. You know that you're a spoiled king when you can pull pranks on people constantly and never have anyone try and stop you or fight back. This was basically the life of King Christian VII of Denmark, who was known for being pretty childish and playing pranks on people his whole life. He was a troublemaker through and through. He was known to play pranks on his grandmother by putting pins in her throne and he would throw things at her and he even ran through the streets with his friend and his mistress, destroying shops and patrons patronizing brothels. He even made his own torture rack, had himself tied to it, and flogged. Why? I have an idea, but I don't want to think about that one too hard. One of the other weird things that he was known to do was leapfrog over dignitaries when they would bow to him. 
This guy was really quite immature. At number three, saints in bed. I understand the desire to feel protected by whatever gods or saints you might believe in. That's one of the whole points of religion. However, I think some people can take that idea a little bit too far, and by some people, I mean the Spanish royal family. These guys took religion very, very seriously, and they believed that following religion heavily would allow God to heal them when they were sick. So, when a member of the royal family was ill, doctors would remove body parts or even entire corpses of saints from churches and monasteries and would put them in bed with the person who was ill. Yeah, they slept with the corpses of dead saints to be healed of their sickness. Could you imagine if that was still how medicine was practiced today? At number two, rat court martial. There has been a record of many kings throughout history who were complete children through and through. Even though many of them grew into adulthood, they still acted immature, and one of the greatest examples of that was Peter III of Russia. He was not a good ruler or a good husband to his wife, who would later become Catherine the Great. Peter spent every night in bed with her playing toy soldiers because he was obsessed with his little dolls. He was so obsessed, in fact, that when a rat chewed the head off one of his toy soldiers, he was so upset that he held a proper military court martial for the rat. He proclaimed the rat guilty of treason and had it hung in a tiny gallows that he had built for the occasion. It was weird, but in the end that bizarre event helped Catherine overthrow her husband, so I guess it kind of worked out for someone. And finally, at number one, groom of the stool. Guys, I found the worst job in history. You think working at the one star Domino's pizza in your neighborhood is bad? Wait until you find out about the groom of the stool. The groom of the stool was a job created during the reign of Henry VIII, where the role was to monitor and assist the king in his bowel movements. They would carry around a commode at all times, and they were also tasked with monitoring the king's diet and meal times, and would organize the king's days around his is uh break times. They were also tasked with undressing the king for him to do his business, and it's also been suggested that they would have had to quote, cleanse the royal posterior as well. Sounds like a pretty crappy job to me, but I'm I'm not funny. I'll leave. Number 10, Peppy the second. When you were six years old, I'm pretty sure the only responsibility you had was to tell your mom if you wet the bed by accident, or making sure you clean up after yourself, and of course, just being a kid. But for Peppy the second, this was a tiny child ruling a massive kingdom. His priorities was to rule Egypt and be the young king he was literally born to be. I mean, hey, at least this six-year-old has a job, so what's your excuse? Now, keep in mind, this was a six-year-old, and he was obviously at one point going to be extremely spoiled, and of course, court members would travel everywhere to impress him with gifts. So, one of his court members got him a dancing pygmy from Africa, knowing very well his new young pharaoh was going to freak the heck out seeing him. Pepe was so obsessed and extremely attached to the dancer that he told the man who found the pygmy that he was under strict rules to make sure nothing happens to him. In life or in death, he better take care of his personal dancer, and when Pepe got older, his demands started getting more like Cusco from the Emperor's New Groove, plus a little bit more inhumane, where he had his slaves stripped naked and covered in honey. He did this because he wanted his slaves to follow him around just to keep the flies away. Either way, he was far the longest ruling Egypt. Egyptian monarch at 94 years old, and Pepe's rule end up in economy disarray due to virtually no oversight. Number nine. Pharaohs. There's always going to be pee mentioned somewhere when it comes to history's gross weird acts, and I am sorry. Pharaohs was a pharaoh who suffered from blindness, and his father, Sesterus, may have passed it down to him, but of course Egyptian court's official said it was a curse. The assumption of the cause was because when Pharaoh was young, he threw a spear into the Nile River for flooding, and the gods got mad and struck him blind. Ten years later, Pharaohs was getting annoyed at his blindness, and so an oracle told him he can get his sight back if he washes his eyes with the urine of a woman who has never slept with anyone other than her husband. So he did just that. He would try to use his own wife's, but it didn't work, which now him and his wife had to go to counseling for potential cheating. And so then he would have to go around town and ask every woman to pee in a pot and pour it into his eyes. And somehow it worked. He found a woman who wasn't cheating on her husband, and he got his eyesight back. He married her on the spot, burned his old wife, and that was that. Of course, it was unlikely that Pharaoh's really got his sight back through magical urine, but he just needed a good story to explain his weird habit. Number eight, Cleopatra the Seventh. I will briefly mention her chaotic and absolutely horrendous family in a moment, but Cleopatra the Seventh, or as we know, her as only and solely as Cleopatra. She was known not just for her, in her intellect and beauty, but her twilight love-like triangle relationships with hot bod Julius Caesar and raging wolfman Mark Antony. Of course, of course, of course, there is some debate if whether or not she was a mad king. After all, she was brilliant in using her tactics to ensnare and bewitch the minds and bodies of powerful men in order to ensure the security of her kingdom. But unfortunately, her ego did get in the way and lost the battle with Mark Antony, and Egypt then became a province of the Roman Empire, bringing in an end to her reign. But the way she would try to manipulate 
emulate these leaders would be one for the books. Chris Jenner works hard, but Cleopatra works harder. At one point, she needed to seduce Julius Caesar, but she was not allowed at any point to get physical with him, let alone alone with him. So she would strip naked and rolled herself into some bedsheets or rugs and told his servants to door dash deliver her to his door. And when they said, hey Julius, we got a package for you, they rolled her out of those sheets and she rolled into his. And they gave that delivery a full five stars, tip included. <laughs> But of course, the main reason why she's even on this list is because she assassinated her siblings, including the two she was married to, careless about the money, like spending 10 to 20 million dollars on a single meal, and of course, brainwashing her citizens, believing that she was their goddess and allowing the downfall of Egypt through failed military tactics. And before he went around dismantling religions to get some nookie, Henry was a devout choir boy. You might know Henry as the king who split from Rome and brought around the Anglican faith, but in his youth, Henry was a vehement supporter of Catholicism and and its head. He sent tin from Cornwall to adorn the roof of Pope Julius II's new palace. He supported the papacy and in 1521 even published a book length slam poem against the German Protestant reformer Martin Luther. He referred to Luther as a venomous serpent, a pernicious plague, an inferal wolf, an infectious soul, a detestable trumpeter of pride, calamities, and schism. In recognition of Henry's forceful piety, Pope Leo the X, I can't remember that number, awarded him the title of Fidi the Defensier, aka Defender of the Faith. Henry was actually going to join the church himself before his older brother Arthur died and left him a throne and a wife to take care of. Scarcely a decade after being called Defender of Faith, Henry led a schism of his own, cleaving the Church of England into the wider Catholic Church after the Pope Clement refused to annul Henry's 16 year marriage to Catherine. Oh, it's time, y'all, because you may have known he was a womanizer, but did you know Henry was also a consistent king? What do I mean? Have you guys ever paid attention to the names of his wives? So, they were Catherine of Aragon, Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour, Anne of Cleves, Catherine Howard, and Catherine Parr. So it went, Catherine, Anne, Jane, Anne, Catherine, Catherine. I feel like if Henry had lived longer, there would have been another Anne and a Jane that would have come along, and then another Catherine, Catherine. Ironically, Jane Seymour, the middle wife and the only unique name in the bunch, was Henry's favorite. But more on that sappy tale in a bit. There's a common belief that Henry married and discarded his six wives in quick succession, but that's not exactly true. When Henry's older brother died, he inherited a kingdom and a wife, Catherine, and they remained married for nearly 24 years. During that time, Catherine was faithful to Henry, but Henry was sticking it in any lady he could find, except Anne Boleyn, who made him wait. So his answer, annul a whole marriage just to get some. But as mentioned, Pope wouldn't do that, so Henry had to start a whole new religion just so he could. Guess he shouldn't have done that, because Henry gets so desperate to end the relationship with Anne, he makes up allegations, maybe history's rocky on that, of adultery and treason, and had the marriage annulled and her beheaded. Jane had served as a lady and waiting to both Catherine and Anne. And I kid you not, Anne and Jane had gotten in actual fist fights because of Anne's jealousy. So just picture a 15th century cat fight. On October 12, 1537, Jane gave birth to Edward, their only male heir, and then died from complications due to the birth several weeks later. This is the only woman Henry had actually truly loved, and the loss decimated him for two years. His next wife, another Anne, catfished him with her portrait. Turns out she's ugly, and they amicably divorce after six months, so she lives out her life in comfy love in the country. Smart woman. The next Catherine was all young and hot at the time when Henry was repugnant and unable to walk, and it was more of a classic sugar baby situation. She cheated a bunch and got beheaded. The final Catherine was a grown up mature adult woman, shockingly a widow or two, and of all of Henry's wives, Catherine had the most influence on the court culture, religion, and role of women, and she also persuaded Henry to restore his daughters Mary and Elizabeth to the order of succession. When you marry at that many women, however, it's actually easy to see where his heart laid. Years before his death, Henry made plans to build a monumental tomb for himself, but also Jane Seymour. She truly was his favorite queen, the one woman he definitely loved, and the mother of his only surviving male heir. Henry went as far as to confiscate a black marble sarcophagus that was originally intended for the powerful churchman Cardinal Wolsey to be used at the center of their tomb. The monumental tomb was in the works for most of his time on the throne, but during the tumultuous years after his death in 1547, it was never completed. So Henry and Jane were left to rest in peace in what was going to be temporary lodgings in Windsor castle until said monument was all wrapped up. But it never did, and the kingdom was so bankrupt that it didn't really ever come around. So, completing
doing it seemed a little impractical. It had been a long time and Henry's intended tomb is now actually home to another famous figure. Two and a half centuries later, the sarcophagus became part of an ornate national monument, the final resting place of Horatio Nelson, the great British naval hero of the Napoleonic Wars. Anyways, on to his children, because these poor guys were nearly victims of their dad's dirty plan. For the longest time, Henry didn't have a legitimate male heir, so he decided to concoct what, had it come to fruition, might have been the grossest marriage ever. Although I feel like the Habsburgs would hear that sentence and as a challenge say, hold my beer. Anyways, Jane may have popped out Henry's only official heir, but he did have an illegitimate son by his mistress. Henry Fitzroy, a surname that literally means son of the king, so a hilarious thing to name your bastard child, was named Duke of Richmond. In order to ensure that his country didn't descend into literal war again over lack of male heir, King Henry wanted Fitzroy to be the next monarch. How may you ask? Why marry the boy to his half sister Mary? This plan got so close to fruition that the cup already had the green light from the Pope. Thankfully, Fitzroy was in love and married someone else. When Fitzroy died at age 17, it left the door open for Henry's legitimate kids to take the throne. Thankfully, as mentioned, Jane ensured both daughters as well as the son got their chance. And speaking of Fitzroy's half sister, Bloody Mary, she wasn't the only family member that wasn't all there. Henry the Heck Dick is next. It's widely known that quite a few of these famous noble and aristocratic lines were also plagued by mental illness. Various theories have pointed at Henry's syphilis and brain injuries as possible causes. After all, it would be logical to assume that the damage occurred to the frontal lobes from having a horse buck him off twice. That region of the brain processes impulse control, external cues from other actions, and social and lustrous behavior. He also began to comfort eat around this period. Everyone's heard of that person who's had a stroke and just wasn't the same afterwards. So brain damage likely could be the explanation. In 2020, researchers actually discovered what they believe is the site where Henry received the blow to his head that could have caused traumatic brain injury. But it might come down to hereditary psychiatric problems in the family. His paternal great grandmother, Catherine of Valois, was the daughter of the famously mentally ill King Charles III. Her family's psychiatric issues seem to have been passed down through generations to multiple British monarchs. In his later years, Henry had a significant personality shift towards paranoia, fits of rage, depression, and anxiety. And he sent crowds of prisoners to the Tower of London. He sent more men and women to their deaths than any other English monarch and estimated 57 to 72,000 people. Yikes. Dictator numbers. But one thing about Henry, no matter how unhealthy homeboy got, he earned that chub. Huge misconception. Henry was only morbidly obese in the last few years of his life. For a long time before that, however, he was one of the most handsome and hella fit men of his era. Dude was well over six foot and had a 34 inch waist. In 1536, Henry was taking part in a tournament when he fell off his horse and the horse fell on him, leaving the king unconscious for several hours and forever altering his cheerful outgoing personality. This is the second horse related mass head injury Henry sustained. After this injury and the further ulcer development in his legs, Henry was left pretty much unable to exercise. His made to measure suits of armor chart the king's expansion with his final set around 1540, suggesting he weighed more than 300 pounds within a waist of 54 inches. As a matter of fact, Henry was so overweight he needed a mechanical device to help him get in and out of bed. When he died in 1547, he weighed nearly 400 pounds with a 60 inch waist. Impressive in a time before 10 cheeseburgers for $10, but I mean if you're over 50, ruled a kingdom, injured his health for around 30 years, you can just let go. Who cares? And last, but never the least, Henry was a hypochondriac king. Henry was obsessed with sickness and disease, specifically the sweating sickness and the plague. This is pretty fair. By the age 30, he'd already caught smallpox and malaria a couple times. Anytime there was an outbreak of anything, he would minimize his risk of infection by straight up leaving London and limiting the number of ambassadors he saw. Even when Anne Boleyn caught the sweating sickness in 1528, Henry said peace and stayed far away until she got better. Henry, bad husband. Good infection minimizer though. Naturally, like any germaphobe, Henry was doing the most to feel clean. So he was known to self-medicate. He even wrote his own prescription book, which detailed how to treat ulcers and reduce inflammation. He diagnosed himself with so many illnesses and disorders that it was actually hard to keep track of all of them. From migraines to insomnia and gout, Henry's life was spent dealing with and or avoiding various different diseases and ailments. Despite his many tyrannical qualities, Henry wasn't all that bad. He actually improved English medicine due to his outlandish paranoias, bringing the country further into the Renaissance. As the founder of the Royal College of Physicians, the king also passed seven different laws to control the practice of medicine. In 1540, Henry pushed through one of the earliest laws to regulate drugs. Apothecary wares had to be checked to make sure no one was defrauding honest customers. His reign also contributed to the increase of supervision of sewers thanks to his chancellor and future victim, Sir Thomas More, who drastically improved the quality of London's public water supply. At number 10, the king of hobbies. Everyone has their interests, right? Like for example, I like video games and I like watching people scream at their teammates for not helping everyone else out. 
I'm looking at you, Blake. For kings, back in the day, they didn't have people on Rocket League to scream at, so they had to find other interests. For Tsar Peter the Great, he had a lot of interests, and they were all very bizarre. Firstly, he had an obsession with short people, especially dwarves. To him, they were like his real life dolls or something, and he would hold weddings for them, and even hold lavish funerals, complete with small horses pulling a small coffin on a carriage, and even a very short priest to hold the ceremony. But other than this obsession with short people, he also dabbled a bit in medicine. He liked watching surgeries be performed like he was trying to be on Grey's Anatomy or something, but when watching the surgeries just wasn't enough for him, he would sometimes perform them himself. Now remember, He's not a doctor, so it's no surprise to learn that these surgeries rarely ever went well and people died. I certainly wouldn't trust him to give me any kind of surgery, but he was a king so he could do whatever he wanted. Peter the Great also loved dentistry. It is said that if you wanted to get all buddy buddy with the king, all you had to do was let him pull your tooth. Sounds like the guy was one heartbreak away from starting his own medical drama, but in the worst way. Number 9. Banning Coffee This is the worst of the worst, people. Murad the Fourth, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. The guy banned coffee. Coffee, like an absolute monster. No more triple triples for you. He was born in 1612 and for the most part his mother was ruling through him because he was so young. That's often the case with most of these young rulers. They just get, hey you're seven, now you rule a kingdom, enjoy. It's, you know, it's tough, they're not going to know what's going on. But when he got a little bit older he put forth these laws, punishable by death, might I add, in order to get things back on track. That was the key. He banned coffee, tobacco, and alcohol. He would actually disguise himself as a civilian during the nighttime and would wander around aimlessly in hopes that he would find one of these dark roast renegades. If you were caught outside having a quick smoke break, you weren't arrested, you didn't get fined, but rather, Murad IV himself would take your head off right there in the streets. No trial, no jury, just straight to execution. All because you're drinking a Bud Light Lime. At number eight, why are you mad? Now this could be a bit of a controversial opinion, but if your name includes the words the mad, I would assume that you're not doing too great, right? I mean, you have to earn that title, and if it's a title that harsh, that simply begs the question, what in the H-E double hockey sticks did you do to get that name? Well, for Charles the Mad, he did a lot. Charles became king when he was only 11 years old, so that certainly didn't help his development and knowing this kind of helps explain a lot of his actions. He was known for getting really angry and throwing fits of rage and was known to give people the gift of the big sleep, if you know what I mean. Charles didn't always kill people though, only sometimes. Other times he liked to switch things up. Sometimes he would run around his palace pretending to be a wolf. Other times he would go through phases where he just really didn't want to keep up with his personal hygiene and he would get so gross that he literally had to be cut out of his own clothes. Now I don't know how long you have to go without bathing to get to that point, but really I don't think I want to know the answer to that question. Charles also thought that he was made of glass and so he would go through phases where he would sit completely still so that he didn't break. Kind of like Drax from Guardians of the Galaxy, but not as, you know, extraterrestrial. Well, maybe he was. That honestly would explain a lot. Number 7, Xerxes I. He is often portrayed as a tyrant and it is likely that as a Persian king, his disregard for local traditions did not endear him to the Egyptians. Xerxes I was very much a pharaoh in absentia where his failed attempts to invade Greece ensured that his portrayal by Greek historians was also seen in a Hollywood extension of the film 300 was not kind. He had a reputation for harsh punishments, womanizing and draining the Persian Empire's coffers. He built immense palaces and other projects at Persepolis and left his mark on the history of both Europe and Asia. He was more or less a power driven and conquer. All he wanted was to conquer Greece due to the conflicts his father had started. He would loot, pillage, enslave Persians, but eventually was defeated by Cyprus. Number six, Pharaoh Samtik III. I too would send my armies to protect cats, and even though I'm still upset about that one pope who declared people to kill a bunch of cats, this pharaoh seems to be pretty cool to me. Samtik III, he knew that cats were considered the best, as cats were often associated with Bastet, who is the goddess of fertility, protection, and good health. As a result, it was considered a crime in ancient Egypt to harm or through inaction allow a cat to come to harm. But he had placed the well-being of cats above his own people when Pharaoh Samtik III literally told his army not to fight because an army commander had released hundreds of cats onto the battlefield. That commander was the Persian king Cambyses II, who knowing of the Egyptians loved cats and his men actually collected a bunch of cats prior to the battle and ordered them to simply walk up to the front gate. The Egyptians, under threat of death from their pharaoh, had no choice but to let Cambyses' men walk straight into the city unchecked. Cambyses' men then methodically
luckily slaughtered anyone who dared challenge them using shields with cats to draw on them. Number five, Menkara. Menkara, a pharaoh who ruled in the 26th century BC, definitely had his doubts. When an oracle came to him and told him that he only had six years left to live, he was terrified and he did everything he could to avoid it. And he decided he could fool the gods as long as the night never came. Menkara figured if a new day never began and time could not pass and so he could not die. Right. So every night he lit up as many lamps as he could and convinced himself it was still daytime for the rest of his life. Menkara would not sleep. He spent every night drinking and celebrating under artificial light. Terrified of the moment when his light finally went out. But of course he did not die. Not sure if it was due to his age or the fact that it is not medically recommended to succumb to insomnia as one would increase a risk of hypertension, diabetes, obesity, depression, heart attacks, and a stroke. He died at the age of 32 and ruled for roughly 18 to 22 years. Number four, Tutmos I. Although history does call him a great leader as he was able to expand Egypt's empire in Nubia, which today is known as Sudan, as well as his advances in Syria, with his advancements like that also equals to a fair share of violence and catastrophes that affect the very people he plundered and pillaged. Known for his cruelty, which was on full HD display, he found a Nubian king and took off his head with his hands, and then sailed home with his body hanging on the ship's prow. He wanted to intimidate his rivals and potentially rebels from messing with him ever again. However, the stunt caused more problems as it led to multiple battles and wars. During the rules of monarchs, cults were formed to worship them, and Tutmos the first cult lasted for centuries after his death, which is unusual occurrence. And this statue of monarch is at the heart of a tableau representing offerings and ceremonies in his honor. Number three, Akhenaten. Egyptians had many gods, but for Akhenaten, he said, we're going to have one god, and it is the one I can only worship. Aten, the god of sun, is meant to major upheaval on how Egypt was run and took a lot of work to do it. So much, in fact, that he literally worked his people to death. He built a whole new city in honor of this god, moved 20,000 people there, and had them built it no matter how badly their bodies ached. These people had to push through everything. Based on the bones in the town cemetery, more than two-thirds of his workers broke a bone while they were working, and a good one-third of them broke their spines. The people were barely fed, and almost every person in the town was malnourished, and they were not allowed to do anything about it. If they broke rank and tried to snatch a little something extra, they were sentenced to be repeatedly poked with a sharp object. And that was all for nothing. As soon as Akhenaten died, everything he did was destroyed, and his very name was erased from Egyptian history. Number two, Ramses II. Ramses lived so long that people started getting seriously worried that he might not never die. In a time when most kings got assassinated within their first few years, Ramses II lived up to 91 years old. He enjoyed his time alive too. Right up to the very end, he built more statues and monuments than anyone ever, and he slept with more women than anyone ever too. By the time he died, Ramses II had at least 100 children with at least nine wives, and it took a lot of sleeping with women to get there, but he made sure he put those hours in. When he invaded Keda, he refused to sign a peace treaty unless they handed over their eldest daughter, and he did not shy away from his daughters either. He married at least three of his own kids, including his firstborn. Number one, the Ptolemy Pharaohs. Finally, at number one, we have the Ptolemy Pharaohs. This family of mad kings are definitely on this list. Starting with Ptolemy IV, he eliminated his mother, who got rid of his dad for having an affair with her mom, which is his grandma, and then Ptolemy IV married his sister and then got rid of her after her husband brother's death. Are you with me so far? Because there's more. Ptolemy VI fought his brother Ptolemy V for the throne and married his sister Cleopatra II, and then Ptolemy VII was killed by his uncle, where Ptolemy VIII married Cleopatra II, but then he had an affair with her daughter Cleopatra III, then she killed her sister Cleopatra IV, and was later like got, got by by her widowed brother in law. I'm gonna go fast forward a bit because there's a lot of back and forth with the different Ptolemies and Cleopatras, until we get to the one that we know. Cleopatra VII, as we know in history, that Cleopatra was the last ruler of Egypt. Basically, her father, Ptolemy XII, decapitated her sister because she hated him, and eventually Cleopatra VII had to marry her brother, got rid of him, married the other brother, and then also got rid of him, and then her sister dragged her through the streets of Rome as a prisoner because of Julius Caesar, and had her sister sacrificed at a temple because of her other lover, Mark Antony. These are terrible people, and are definitely insane. <laughs> Some were not too mad, some were just ambitious leaders with great desires to rule, and others were just insane. After all, we could only gather so much from what we know from history, especially from these times. Number 10. No one's ever really gone. You may have heard that said when losing a family member, a pet, or in the worst Star Wars movies ever made. Sorry, not sorry Disney, those are terrible. But perhaps there is someone who is never really gone. Genghis Khan, yes that's right, the ruthless Mongol warrior who conquered so much in his time that we're still talking about it today. So why is this big bad warrior still with us today? Well, that's because of DNA. Yeah, in his time there was uh, lots of activities going on, besides the usual pillaging the village and unaliving those who oppose you. There were a lot of happy endings, let's say, and by that I mean forced non-YouTube friendly conduct, bedroom, 
happy ending. So much so that when a study was conducted back in 2003, 8% of men in Asia were thought to be descendants of the mighty man himself. 0.5% worldwide. That doesn't sound like a lot, but we're talking about millions of people here. Next time you go out, you may be brushing shoulders with the warrior's kin. Prepare for battle! Number 9. Henry again? Boy, it's really hard not to talk about this guy. But dude was kinda down bad for it. He's just most well known for his mistreatment of his wives. And by mistreatment, I don't mean getting into a fight over whether or not the toilet seat should be up or down and then having a very toxic argument in front of family members. No, because when Henry was upset with marriage, he wanted divorce, which honestly was kind of taboo for the time. Oh yeah, and he also beheaded two of his wives because... That's how it goes. I know every couple has their issues to work out, but for most dads out there, having sun-drenched beer-fueled weekends, they never go beheading after that. Although, dad's been staring at the lawnmower for a while and there's a lot of blades on that. I don't... Dad? While it is true King Henry VIII did behead two wives, he didn't do it to all of them. And at some points we're honestly quite pleased with his holy sanctity of marriage. Anyone who's ever been married can tell you how peaceful and sacred that bond really is. Number 8. The People's Princess Okay, I know Prince Charles isn't exactly a king, but he is royalty and the man kinda did Diana dirty. That's a quick and half put together allusion to a Michael Jackson song for the English majors and the audience. Being royalty isn't easy. Being royalty in a modern age when paparazzi overwhelm you with lights and cameras just for a juicy piece of gossip like, when was your last bowel movement? Is it slow? Extra extra, read all about it, the princess is constipated. That's just not fun. So after Prince Charles and Princess Diana had been married for a few years, you can understand how excited the media was to find out about their marital disputes. There was three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded, was a quote by Princess Diana that gave the media a field day. Sadly, Prince Charles was having an affair, and it wouldn't be too much longer that Diana would perish in a car accident that may or may not be organized by the royal family themselves. No At number 7, Jahangir. So this guy was super impatient to become the ruler and was getting tired of Daddy Akbar taking his time. So he revolted. Damn, this court honestly was just rife with rebellion. They never got tired of it. In 1599, while his father was otherwise engaged and away from the palace, Prince Salim led a revolt. During the revolt, he even skinned a man alive. Akbar was pissed about this and wrote to his son and said, quote, I have never skinned a bird alive in my life and you have treated a human being in this manner. Jahangir then went on to conspire against a close advisor of his father named Abul Fazl, whom Jahangir killed in a small battle. Despite Akbar being devastated at his son's behavior, he was the only male heir left to inherit. So on Akbar's deathbed, he forgave his son and implored the nobles to recognize him as a leader. At number 6, so to an ox. Now Jahangir was emperor but the trouble didn't stop there. I saw some sources recognize him as a somewhat benevolent figure while others said that he was the exact opposite. He was pretty brutal and his first task was crushing a rebellion against that which his own son began. Apple, not far from the tree. He was traveling to Lahore when he came across two nobles who were sympathetic to his son's cause. So he decided to punish them in a very peculiar and violent way. He ordered that one be sewed to the skin of an ass and the other to an ox. Now that is messed up. When he got to Lahore to face the rebels, he crushed them and blinded his own son as punishment. A ruler couldn't have any impediments, so therefore his son could no longer pursue the role. Then he hung his son's followers outside of Taksali Gate. Yeah, so even within the confines of war, this guy had some pretty messed up ideas. At number 5, the horse and his boy. On the less violent end of the spectrum, Jahangir was actually a big fan of the arts, science, and worldly things. Unlike his father who couldn't read and write, an interesting skill for a ruler not to have, Jahangir was all about it. He really wasn't interested in military, which was a task he left to his son. But he did inherit his father's wealth and considering he wasn't working in the military, he had time to indulge his curiosity. In his memoirs, there are fantastic paintings of exotic animals. There's a painting of a zebra that has a very funny story behind it. The zebra was being taken as a gift to the Shah Fawid Shah and it was traveling through the port of the empire. Jahangir heard about it and had it brought to court first and didn't believe that it was real. He thought that it was a painted horse, so he had people try and wash them off. Only when the paint didn't come off, 
did he realize his mistake and ordered that the wondrous creature be painted. On number four, Shah Jahan and the Taj Mahal. Okay, so this one isn't messed up for violence or anything, but it is the ultimate love story and we just can't leave it off this list. There is one part that is messed up to me because man, I don't even know, but we will get to that. If you've ever been to India, then one of the stops you made on your trips was probably to the Taj Mahal, a breathtaking mausoleum built by the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan to commemorate the love of his life. Considering how big and intricate it is, you know that their love was bigger than any storybook. An Indian poet called the Taj Mahal a teardrop on the cheek of time, a testament to grief and power. Mumtaz Mahal was Shah Jahan's favorite wife, forsaking all of his other wives just to be with her. They went everywhere together, even on military missions. This is where, from my perspective, where things get crazy. This woman delivered 14 children for her husband. 14. Sadly, while giving birth to the last, she passed away, inspiring her king to build this massive structure. Both Shah Jahan and his love are buried beneath it. At number three, Brothers at Odds. Shah Jahan's rule was considered the golden rule of the Mughal Empire, so how do you top that? Aurangzeb did not even bother trying, and he kinda sucked. He was Shah Jahan's third son, and he was a very military minded man, showing tactical and strategic military skill and unrivaled determination. Whereas his brother was a man of letters, and no, not the kind from Supernatural. Aurangzeb wanted power, and so in order to secure his rule, he confined his ailing father to his own palace, caused the death of one of his brothers, and had two more of his brothers, a son and a nephew, executed. He was literally committing fatricide left, right, and center. But it didn't matter to him because he gained control. His desire to prematurely end the lives of those who stood in his way was described as, quote, a wolf thirsting for the blood of his brothers, end quote. You would think that this motivation to gain power and rule on his own terms would mean that he had big plans for the empire, which in a way is true, but those plans and changes led to a lot of oppression, but we will get to that in a bit. At number two, staked. Before we get into the oppression that Aurangzeb caused to his empire, let's talk about Emperor Farooq Siyar. Farooq Siyar was emperor of the Mughal Empire from 1713 to 1719. He was described as an incapable ruler who gave his power to all of his advisors. His rule caused many conspiracies and plots to arise within the court. He caused a lot of people a lot of pain for his plight for power. With the help of his allies, he gave many of his enemies the gift of the big sleep, but by far the most ruthless thing he did was kill Jahandar Shah and Zulkifakar Khan Nazrat Zang. What made their death so brutal was the fact that when they went eh, the emperor hung their heads on poles, and just to add insult to injury, he made their parents walk at their funeral. Luckily for the people of the Mughal Empire, Farooq Sahir was killed by unknown assailants at the instructions of his close relatives, putting an end to his awful reign. And finally, at number one, the Great Oppressor. Aurangzeb's rule sort of had two chapters to it. At first, Aurangzeb was a capable ruler of a mixed Muslim Hindu empire who was feared yet respected for his vigor and skill. But around 1680, Aurangzeb's rule changed drastically in both policy and attitude. His once unified people of both Muslims and Hindus broke apart, and people of Hindu faith became subordinates, not colleagues. On top of that, Aurangzeb added some more oppression to the mix and not only destroyed Hindu temples, but he also also reimposed the Giza tax on non-Muslims after the tax was initially banned by Emperor Akbar. For the first 20 years of Aurangzeb's rule, he did not impose a tax, but all of a sudden he started demanding these payments, and historians believe that Hindu uprisings are what caused the emperor to act harshly towards the non-Muslim population. This discrimination caused a revolt to unfold that Aurangzeb's third son supported. Aurangzeb spent his last 50 years taking his aggressions out on the Hindus in the empire, and it's for this reason that he is remembered by many as a tyrant. Before we wrap things up for today, I want you guys to leave a comment down below telling me what from this list you think was the most messed up from these Mughal kings? Leave me your thoughts down below. Starting with his entrusted and encrusted crap man. In Henry's court, his servants vied to be as physically close to the king as possible at all times. In case you aren't aware, especially towards the end of his reign, Henry was a tad bit of a lunatic. The more he liked you, the less likely you were to die for looking at him funny on a bad day of his. But naturally, the monarch reserved the honor of being close to his royal person only for a trusted few people. People, the grooms of the stools. No, not his counselor, personal butler, none of his advisor, the guy that wiped his ass. And during his reign, only four men got the gig of groom of the stool, the most physically intimate position and therefore the most honored of his attendants. These grooms 
not only helped dress and undress the king before and after the bathroom and, you know, handled the poop brush for him, but in an insane twist, they also controlled public and personal access to the monarch and some of his finances. They even had power over a stamp of the king's signature, which is a major financial tool. Imagine being one of his wives and having to ask the guy who wipes your husband's if you can talk to him, and he says no. But if he could afford that kind of luxury employee, why was he called the Copper-Nosed King? Easy, while Henry's kingdom amassed a great wealth and property during the English Reformation by confiscating Catholic monasteries, Henry then turned around and drove England into debt with his overspending and lavish lifestyle. Dude was a complete eclectic, and he wanted to buy everything shiny and pretty he saw, so he did. It's reported by the time he dropped, Henry owned approximately 50 palaces, 6,500 plus weapons, 70 ships, 78 recorders, 78 flutes, 5 sets of bagpipes, and a virginal. Get your mind out of the gutter, it's a type of harpsichord. Not to mention the millions of dollars he pumped into wars with Scotland and France. So it's pretty obvious he was burning through the kingdom's funds, and by the end of his reign, Henry had it down to the pocket change. Quite literally. He was forced to lower the percentage of silver in the British coinage to the point that they were mostly copper with the silver coating that wore away from the coins embossed image of Henry's face, starting with the nose. Thus, Copper Nose. When Henry's son Edward took the throne, the royal coffers were in a real bad state. But before we get to his love life and kiddos, let's learn about how Frisky runs in the family. It's well known that Henry's older brother, the first husband of Henry's first wife, Catherine, died young. But did you know he had two royal sisters who made his life a living hell for fun? Henry's older sister, Margaret, was just as feisty as her brother. She was sent to Scotland to marry that country's king, James IV, at just 13. She did produce an heir after a couple years, the future James V, but her crappy adulterous playboy spouse didn't live terribly long. So as a single queen, Margaret wanted to keep up her luxe lifestyle at her brother Henry's expense, which he did not love. Maggie battled it out with the Scottish nobles over the right to serve as her son's regent, but she fell for and married another Scottish noble, the Earl of Angus. Henry's other sister, Mary, had some equally troublesome marriage issues, at least for Henry. He married her first to the elderly King Louis of France, but that monarch passed away very shortly after. A smart woman who recognized being married to a literal senior could kind of work in her favor made Henry promise her before her marriage if she was to be widowed, her next husband would be a man of her own choosing. Henry agreed, which hilariously was a bad idea but only for him because now a widow, Mary chose to wed a commoner who was Henry's best friend, Charles Brandon. The king was furious that Mary would marry against his will since he had no intention of keeping his promise to her and that her second wedding took away the opportunity opportunity for him to make alliances using her. But Mary and Brandon told him to suck it and stayed married till her death. Their descendants included the Lady Jane Grey, the infamous Nine Day Queen. Number 7. Midlife Crisis this one's kind of generalized because if I didn't, I'd have to mention almost every king ever. So here we go. Back in ye olde times, the access to better health care just wasn't there. Doctors aren't washing hands. Imagine, buddy eats some greasy mutton and then says, alright, time for your enema. But those aren't the only greasy hands around certain orifices I'm talking about. I'm talking about kings marrying older girls at the ripe age of 12. Yep, that's right. Nothing says experience and womanhood like being 12. People didn't live long, and oftentimes these arranged marriages had ulterior motives, like alliances or business, really. However, that does not make up for marrying a 12 year old who may or may not have started those super weird changing times, like when you were 12 and now there's hair showing up in places that you didn't know there could be hair. I sent a courier to the chief, and he came back with this message It ain't it. Number 6. Till death do us part. Love and marriage go together like a horse and carriage, but sometimes the crooning words of Frank Sinatra aren't enough to keep people in love. Sometimes marriages end up like the ones we see on sitcoms, but when there's no laugh track, it's not very funny, and sometimes divorce is the answer. Uh? Medieval Germans thought this too, and something they practiced was divorce by combat. Basically the man goes into a hole with his arm tied behind his back and the woman is free to move around with a sack of rocks. These proceedings are strange as I'm sure no husband or wife married today would ever get so frustrated with one another that they would want to hit one another on the head with rocks. Oh the blessings of being married. 
Number 5 Domestic Disturbance William the Conqueror was one down bad dude. The illegitimate ruler to the throne left a bad taste in some people's mouths and was just as ruthless in silencing those rebellions that were always uprising against him as he was with the famous battles he was a part of like the Battle of Hastings. But what I think he should be remembered by is the way he asked Matilda to marry him or rather the extreme measures he took when she refused his advances because he was an illegitimate leader. William dragged Matilda by the hair out into the middle of the street and beat her until she agreed to marry him. I don't have to tell you how messed up that is, and I sure hope I don't. Number 4. Nero Sauna The Romans were kind of a big deal, especially if you're into history. Large city, culture, and some other structures are still around today. That's kind of cool. But while the city of Rome may have been the best city on earth at the time, Romans themselves could use a little work. Meet Emperor Nero, the vicious leader of Rome who became emperor through ill-gotten gains. However, in what may have been one of the first acts of flexing the male patriarchy, the divorce or forced separation of his wife Claudia Octavia comes to mind. It was a rocky marriage from the start. There was a general dislike from the very beginning, but when Nero remarried, as emperors did, he had Octavia banished to an island, where shortly after she would be suffocated in a hot vapor bath. Her demise was sad for most Romans. Oh yeah, and they tried to make it look like she did herself in. That's messed up, man. Number 3. Pedestal I think in a healthy relationship, you ought to put your partner on a pedestal sometimes. Maybe your partner is drop dead gorgeous. A promising athlete really enjoys collecting stamps. You go, little rock star, collect those presidential stamps. However, Emperor Caligula of Rome had some other ideas. He would literally put his wife, who he claimed to love, up on a pedestal stark naked and let his friends in the military gawk and glare at her. He would also say to her that he could end her life whenever he wanted and put a knife against her for no reason. Weird flex, but okay. This guy was awful to everyone as he tormented and unalived so many people. Well, you sure wouldn't want to see his face everywhere as he liked to do just that. Built statues of himself everywhere because after losing your family to his tyranny and looking at his wife, you need to know who's responsible for all this. That's messed up. Number 2. Doozong 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 That wouldn't really be a great fraternity name, would it? Well, the Emperor of Doozong of China would think differently as when he was in charge, that's pretty much what the royal court looked like. Enough drinking to keep AA in meetings for 100 years, and enough ladies of the evening to... Well, I don't have a joke for this one, but there were a lot of them, trust me. Having massive parties like that and enjoying the company of other women is not how you respect your wife. To make matters worse, it seemed that too much partying may have been a bad thing. Who would have thought? As what he made up for in a fun weekend, he lacked in governing, as the Mongols were at his front door, or gate rather. Eventually, his empire would burn to the ground. All thanks to Al. Alcohol and many women who laid down for their lives, literally. Number one, side piece. Look, I enjoy the company of a woman just as much as the next king sits on his throne. But in my opinion, once you find a wife, it's time to settle down, relax. No more crazy parties like Duzong. This is another generalization, but every king did this. Every king in the past has had mistresses. As if that is a totally okay thing to do to your wife and oftentimes the queen of your kingdom. I'm a reasonable guy, so maybe I can see having your side piece waiting in the wings to be stage center, but it's never one, is it? It's always multiple. Ladies of the past, all I can say is make sure you give birth to a boy and watch your back. They're coming for you. At number 10, Royal Enemas. Apparently, back in the day, enemas were all the rage amongst the elite. It was believed that enemas were good for your health, so everyone was doing it to try and live a little longer than the rest of those commoners and peasants. One person who really just couldn't get enough enemas in his life was King Louis XIV. It is believed that over the course of his life, Louis XIV received thousands of enemas. When I tell you this guy was obsessed, I'm not kidding. One year, Louis received 212 enemas. 
in just the one year. And of course, he had to make his enemas a little jazzy and couldn't just use water like any other person. Oh no. My guy was using things like almond milk. His enemas were also sometimes scented with orange or rose and sometimes even colored just to make it a little more special. To get an idea of just how obsessed the elite were with receiving enemas, just think about the fact that a French duchess once received one during a court ball. The duchess was in the middle of having a conversation with Louis XIV and during this conversation, one of her maids came over, snuck under her dress, and gave the duchess an enema on the spot. Ew. These people were so weird. At number 9, Pampered Pony. I'm sure I can speak for most people when I say when you have a pet, you love and care for that thing like it is your child, right? Well, one Roman emperor might have taken that concept a little bit too far because saying that he was obsessed with his horse is an understatement. The Roman emperor known as Caligula had a horse named Incitatus. Caligula was a horse racing enthusiast, so Incitatus was his pride and joy, and not too many people were all that thrilled about it, to be honest. When I tell you this horse was treated better than most people have ever been, I'm not kidding. The horse's stall was made out of marble, his manger was made out of ivory, and he was even fed oats flaked with gold. Caligula was also very adamant about his horse receiving a good and restful sleep before a race, and he was so serious about it that he made guards stand outside of the horse's stable to make sure that the horse remained undisturbed while it slept. This horse even had its own furniture. Like what is he gonna do with it? He's a horse. Caligula was so fond of his horse that he even made it a priest and promised to make him consul, which was the lead position in the Roman government after the emperor, highly coveted by senators. This was the last straw for people because the emperor was putting his horse above his own people, so he was assassinated. Now before I carry on telling you guys about the wild and crazy things that kings did back in the day, I would like to first ask you guys to consider leaving a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and also maybe think about subscribing as well to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Mumia Medicine. It's safe to say that medicine from the past is very different from modern times. These days we have pharmaceuticals to treat illnesses, but back in the days of old there were very different and quite questionable methods of treating ailments, and one of those methods included cannibalism. In the 16th and 17th centuries, it was common practice for elites like priests, kings, and other nobles to consume remedies that included human bones, blood, and fat as medicine to treat ailments from headaches to epilepsy. And this practice was called mummia medicine. At first, it started with people using Egyptian mummies and skulls from Irish graves for use in medicine, as bones would be ground and used in different tinctures for various uses. But soon, other parts of the body started to be used. Human fat was later used to treat ailments on the outside of the body, and blood would be consumed as well as it was believed to contain the vitality of life. Several monarchs were known to use mummia medicine, like Charles II and William II of England, Francois I of France, and Christian IV of Denmark. At number 7, Dental Tools Peter the Great was the Tsar of Russia from 1682 until his passing in 1725. The ruler had his hobbies to pass his time, but one of the weirdest ones was amateur dentistry. Peter was fascinated by the practice, and by amateur, I'm talking he actually had no idea what he was doing at all. Peter collected dental tools as well as people's teeth and a number of other peculiar items, including pickled lizards. Peter's private collection was known as his Chamber of Curiosities, and he would apparently collect the teeth from people that caught his attention. In fact, Peter loved pulling people's teeth so much that he would even remove his target's healthy teeth in the middle of his passion. I'm not sure what the tools or the process was like for pulling teeth back then, but I'd have to imagine you did not want to be chosen to be his next victim. His collection of teeth is still around along with the rest of his weird collection, but I think this is one that I don't need to see. At number 6, Explicit Collection King Farouk was the 10th ruler of Egypt, lasting on the throne from April 1936 until July 1952. As king, he was known for his extravagant playboy lifestyle, and while initially popular, his reputation went down due to the corruption and incompetence of his government. He was deposed in 1952 and spent the remainder of his days exiled to Italy. In his hurry to get out of there and avoid the Mussolini treatment, the king left behind a majority of his prized possessions. Farouk 
was a kleptomaniac and one of his hobbies was picking people's pockets. Along with his collection of stolen goods, the former king also had an extensive collection of explicit materials. The collection was so extensive that when the new government took over, they auctioned off his belongings and was decided that he had accumulated the world's biggest collection of explicit images. People also discovered expensive suits, rare stamps and coins, luxury cars, but his collection of adult content had to be the most jarring to the people going through his things. It's hard to place a number on just how much material he had, but apparently Farouk's collection was too big to fit under a mattress. That being said, reportedly there was a photo album found under his pillow. At number 5, Too Many Castles King Ludwig II of Bavaria, also known as the Swan King or the Fairy Tale King, was the monarch from 1864 until his passing in 1886. Ludwig was a fan of the opera, arts, and spending money in an irresponsibly extravagant way. When Ludwig took the throne, he was only 18 and he increasingly withdrew from day to day affairs of state in favor of extravagant artistic and architectural projects. Today, the former king is known for his fairy tale castles, Neuschwanstein Castle, Linderhof Place, and Heron Chiemsee. Ludwig certainly had a talent with his impressive castles being the inspiration behind Walt Disney's Cinderella Castle, but he got a little carried away building one too many castles. He was also a devoted patron of the composer Richard Wagner. Ludwig spent all his own private royal revenues on these projects, borrowed extensively, and defied all attempts by his ministers to restrain him. Ludwig's castles left him in increasing debt, and in 1886, a group of conspirators filed a medical report drafted by doctors who hadn't actually examined him that declared him permanently unfit to rule. The next morning, he and his personal physician were found floating in a lake under mysterious circumstances that many believed to be homicide. At number four, funeral for a doll. Tsar Peter III of Russia was the emperor from January 5th, 1762, until January 9th of the same year, being thrown over by his wife, Catherine the Great. Catherine earned her nickname simply due to her being just that, great. But her husband on the other hand, according to every account, was creepy, malevolent, and possibly bordering on insane. In her memoirs, Catherine describes him herself as an inept, crude man-child and a drunkard unfit to rule an empire who wished nothing but to play with toys or dress up as a general, place his servants in military outfits, and play war games with them. Peter was also known for loving, collecting, and playing with toy soldiers in his room. One day, Catherine found a rat hanging on his wall. According to The Empire of Russia, Its Rise and Present Power by John Stevens, Catherine wrote, quote, One day when I went into the apartments of His Imperial Highness, I beheld a great rat which he had hanged with all the paraphernalia of an execution. I asked what all this meant. He told me that this rat had committed a great crime, which according to the laws of war, deserved capital punishment. Basically, the rat had chewed the head off one of his beloved dolls, he wanted a full funeral, and Catherine wanted nothing to do with him. At number 3, Enemas. King Louis XIV of France ruled from May 1643 until September 1715. The former French ruler was apparently quite a big fan of using enemas on a regular basis. If you don't know, an enema involves inserting fluid into the lower bowel through the rectum, aiming to empty the bowels, often for a medical examination or administering medication. To be fair, back then it was a common thing to do among royals and nobles of Europe as it was thought to be very good for your health. Even so, Louis was the enema. King. Rumor has it that Louis XIV had thousands of enemas performed throughout his life. It was not uncommon that the king excused himself after dinner, went to his private apartment, had an enema, and then returned to join his courtiers. The king ended up living quite a long life, 76 years, and he credited his long life to his regular enemas. The elite of France were not going to be using just any water for this delicate practice either. Instead, the fluids were perfumed with rose, orange, and angelica, and was even slightly colored by the request of the users. Louis's father and grandfather had been fond of enemas too, but he preferred his with almond milk. During one year, he had 212 enemas performed. At number 2, Mummies Similar to those who paid for Mamiya to heal them, King Charles II of England kept a number of mummies. They were not for educational or entertainment purposes, but simply to gather their dust. This dust was made up of dried skin and whatever else you might find on a mummified corpse, and Charles would actually rub it all over his own body. I guess back 
back then, they really hoped that the deceased had magical healing powers, but looking back now, knowing what we do, that's just nasty. Could you imagine just showering in mummy dust thinking, this is going to make me so great? Charles II believed that by doing this, he could acquire some ancient pharaoh greatness for himself. To be fair, they had a lot of wild beliefs back then, so this wasn't unheard of, but paying for a corpse's dead skin is still insane. King Charles wasn't done there either. He also paid grave diggers to bring him cadavers so he could use their skulls to make an alcoholic concoction called the King's Drops, which he prepared in his personal laboratory. These drops were made from crushed up human skulls and skull moss from Ireland, and the King purchased the concoction for 6,000 euros. And at number one, tall men. King Frederick Wilhelm I of Prussia ruled from February 1713 until May 1740 and was the founder of the Potsdam Giants. This name was given to the Prussian Infantry Regiment No. 6. This group of soldiers was made up of men above 6 feet tall and was eventually dissolved in 1806 after being defeated by Napoleon. Frederick recruited these tall men willingly and unwillingly from various nations. The king himself only stood 5 foot 3 inches tall and the taller soldiers were believed to be a pretty obvious case of overcompensation. Eventually, Frederick became a little too obsessed with collecting gigantic men that he eventually resorted to buying, taking, or breeding them into the regiment to booster his ranks. Frederick Wilhelm was apparently not nice to his troops, treating them more like possessions to show off rather than humans. The king would show off his troops like toys to foreign dignitaries and even painted portraits of them as they marched at his command. The king once said the most beautiful girl or woman in the world would be a matter of indifference to me, but tall soldiers, they are my weakness. By the time he passed, the number of tall soldiers had climbed to 2,500 and Potsdam was littered with unusually tall men by the 18th century. What we gonna start with? Why are you so stingy? You literally live in a castle. You have gold doubloons like an effing pirate, priceless spices stolen from foreign lands, and gemstones harvested fresh from the earth. But you're gonna have us measure every loaf of bread so they're the exact same? Back in the late 1500s, Viscount Montagu demanded meticulous records of every Every expenditure. The clerk of the kitchen was a crossbreed between an extreme couponer and a professional nitpicker who had to provide the cooks with the ingredients for every meal in exact amounts for each person to be served and ensure that each plate had the exact same weight and proportions laid upon it. Among his many duties was also to ensure every wheat loaf that went in the oven weighed 18 ounces and was 16 ounces when it was taken out. What happens if they weighed more or less? Off to the bread breaking wheel or maybe the sourdough slow slicer? Off to the steak for a little French toasting, huh? Anyway, for how the British monarchy would pitch a fit over a three letter word, children, not kids, because we all want to speak a little bit more like Mary Poppins. Oh yes, little children, off to bed we go. Nah, dude, I couldn't do the whole royal nanny thing, to be honest. The, the education required enough makes you think that they're scouting for NASA, not someone to stop their kid from picking its nose, publicly, at least. Maria Barello, the nanny, who takes care of Prince George, Princess Charlotte, and Prince Louis, trained at the notable Norland College in Bath, England before being hired to the world's most famous children. At this college, students like Borallo study early years development for three years. However, as well as learning social and emotional development, students are also taught the importance of vocabulary. There is one word that royal nannies are prohibited from using to describe royal children. Kids. Ask me why. Come on. Ask me. It's because of the exact honky dory dumbass reason you think. It's the baby goat thing. Kids is a name for them and an informal name for children because who says that it's not the Victorian era? According to Heron, the word kid is disrespectful and dissuades royal children from being seen as individuals. You mean like how sheltering them and not allowing them everyday friends or normal reality or exposure to the real world under the guise of safety, but it's more so they grow up in a bubble of unrealistic world perspective and can't understand problems morally and empathetically as an adult, only in a political sense. You mean like that? Sounds like what they're doing. And speaking of the Windsors, did y'all know Charles specifically sucks? A lot of kings imposed a lot of rules for their servants, but something about King Charles gets the most under the skin. Maybe it's because he had some pretty frivolous, unrealistic asks for a man who just got the throne this year. So listen to his tea procedure alone. Charles is very particular for how his tea is served when he's visiting the Paladinian house. When preparing the tea, you must use a teaspoon measurement of tea leaves per cup, and then there must be an exact temperature 
temperature of 7 degrees Celsius for green tea and 100 degrees Celsius for Earl Grey or English breakfast. The prince's hot beverage must also be checked with a thermometer before being served, and honey should always be used to sweeten the tea rather than sugar. When serving the tea to the prince, the teaspoon should be situated precisely to the right underneath of the handle of the cup. Clive Goodman, a royal reporter for News of the World, claimed that Prince Charles does nothing himself. He described the morning scene in which Charles gets ready for the day, but all the preparation is done for him. He gets up in the morning, his bathrobe is there waiting for him. He walks into the bathroom, the bath is drawn for him already. Even when he gets out of the bath, the towel is already folded in a special way, so he just has to sit in it and wrap it around himself. Then he goes into the dressing room, his clothes are laid out for him, even his socks, left and right, are in the exact right spot. Charles even has valets squeeze one inch of toothpaste onto his toothbrush every morning. If anyone gets anything wrong, everyone is scolded. Gosh, and I'm sure y'all remember the viral video of him from September of 2022 forcing a servant to come clear off the desk of like three pieces of paper because he couldn't have done it himself. Number seven, Caligula's wife. I think in a healthy relationship, you ought to put your partner on a pedestal. Maybe your partner is drop dead gorgeous, a promising athlete, or really enjoys building Legos. Nice tie fighter, babe, way to go. <laughs> Emperor Caligula of Rome liked to put his wife on a pedestal, literally. And while on this pedestal, she was wearing nothing but her birthday suit. Oh boy. While all of his friends, politicians, generals got to gawk and stare at her. And in some weird goth power flex, he would oftentimes hold a knife to her and tell her that he could just end her life whenever he wanted because he can do that. Not to mention the guy had a complete narcissist complex, building statues of himself everywhere just so she can like, oh great, there he is again. It's him again. Number six, Kangas Khan. I bring the man up again because he's responsible for so much loss, so much blood spill, so much pain. Sure, they were effective warriors and archers, but they were, they were brutal, dude, especially him. They took what they wanted when they wanted, and it's said that he was responsible for so many lives lost that it affected the carbon footprint of the planet. Dude, that's insane. That is literally insane. Also to note his treatment of rather, uh, well, mistreatment of women, YouTube won't let me say much, but I can tell you that these ladies were not inviting him into their bedrooms. It wasn't, uh, wasn't good. As it stands today, because of his bedroom misconduct, his DNA still lives on. 5% of men worldwide share his DNA. Number five, Pedro of Castile. Pedro of Castile was doing as the European monarchs do. Sometimes you gotta marry for alliances. Sure, it makes sense. Your kingdom is much less likely to get steamrolled by a larger kingdom if you have an alliance with fellow kingdoms or the bigger kingdom itself, actually. Pedro of Castile married the young Blanche of Bourbon of France, and so Spain could just be a wee bit more snug you know, in case the English come over. You gotta be careful. But Pedro just wasn't having it. What he was having instead was a mistress named Maria. So instead of enduring a loveless marriage, he had poor Blanche locked away in a tower, just like Sleeping Beauty. Except a handsome prince was not coming to rescue this damsel in distress, uh, but a man with a black hood and a sharpened axe. You know what I'm talking about. As Pedro had her unalived. I was gonna make a joke about Rapunzel and let down some hair so she could make an escape, but I mean, that's just, that's just awful, really. Imagine being locked up in a tower for so long. Sure, I love the indoors, but you gotta let me out at some point, chief. Do you think I get food delivery apps to work up in a tower? Because otherwise you have to let me out, dude. Comic Con's coming. Anime Convention North's coming, buddy. I gotta go. I gotta get, gotta get my Naruto on, bro. Come on, man. Number four, hands-on funeral. This one's just gross. When you're in a relationship, it can provide you with some great things. Someone to go through life with. Companionship. Love. And if you're lucky, someone who's a good cook or a baker. Oh, love me some baked goods. Mm. However, also in a relationship, sometimes you do more than that. Sometimes you get a little close under the sheets, if you know what I'm saying. Take King Philip V, for example, who loved loving his wife so much that, he, well, he just couldn't help himself, you know? Like, for instance, when his wife tragically passed away, he wanted one last, um, one last ride. But he penciled in one more trip to Toe Curl City before she was laid to rest. I, I just... God, it doesn't seem right, you know? That just let her, you know, let her let her go peacefully, you know? Let her just ah, 
Number three, Lenin. Okay, while not a king in the most stereotypical sense, he did dethrone a king and made himself an autocratic dictator, which is basically a king just modern. Trust me, it is. It, yep, trust me. Mm -hmm. In a nutshell, Lenin had been anti-royal for most of his life, but after some help from some sneaky Germans and other Soviets loyal to his cause, the Tsar had no choice but to abdicate, like I said at the top of the list. He abolished the Tsar's secret police and then put in his own, mm. and had people oppressed, which was one of the main reasons why the whole revolution started in the first place. See what I'm getting at? He was supposed to get rid of the evil monarch, and he became the evil monarch. Hmm. Well, see, then a civil war broke out, and then he was worried that the exiled Tsar might escape and try to retake the throne, and, well, he had some goons take care of him, and, uh, well, the family, too. You, you can never be too sure. You gotta take care of everything. You, know, you gotta get rid of everybody. You just can't be too sure. Number two. Pope John the 12th. For those who aren't very religious like myself, the Pope is the big one. He's next to God, and for a minute there, he was the most powerful man on earth. Seriously, I mean, this guy could crown kings. He's the king of the Vatican, and the king of kings in the Holy Scripture. It's kind of serious. And today, he's got a really cool car for parades. The Pope Mobile is pretty sick, I'm not gonna lie. However, Pope John the 12th was anything but a sweet old man who delivers the holy messages from God. This Pope was doing a lot of anti-Pope behavior, if you will. Now, I for one wouldn't care if the man had a girlfriend or a glass of wine. Heck, some rules need to be changed, but this Pope uh, was most known for his lavish, how you say, adult-themed parties, and was known for getting hangovers. It got so bad at one point, it started a war. Number one, not so slick shady. Marshall Mathers, Eminem, the king of rap and named king of hip hop by Rolling Stones magazine. Hence he's a king, I gotcha. Despite what you think of the man's lyrics, especially vulgarity, he's an excellent wordsmith and could write rhymes that would leave you tongue twisted. However, I don't think it would come to anyone's surprise that the man's got a few charges under his belt, especially the way he talks about Kim. There's a couple, a couple bad things said about her, I don't know. Back in 2001, arguably the peak of his career, Eminem assaulted somebody in a nightclub after getting fresh with his wife. He got two years probation. Hmm. Maybe, maybe, maybe he is saying the things he's saying in those songs. Maybe he's telling the truth. Hmm, I don't know. Kicking off the list at number 10, a fool. While ancient kings have all the riches one man can possibly have, it's still somehow never enough. Kings also have their own walking, talking party. Yeah, how fun is that? The earliest accounts of the fool go back to the 11th century. These fools were hired to liven up the party. Most of you may have an image of a jester in your head just jumping around on tables, telling jokes, juggling with big pointy shoes, wearing pajamas. Yeah, that's pretty accurate. It was pretty fun. One of the best jobs to have was the title of a minstrel or a fool. It was an honor to have, really, and the fool's payment was no joke. Roland Le Pichur was rewarded with 30 acres of land from King Henry II, as long as he showed up to court every year on Christmas Day to fart. Literally, he would show up and fart around. But these fools also held responsibility in their silly little lips. Fools needed to find the balance of humor and wit. It was harder back then than anything. Many of these jesters were given the rule of advisor to the king and queen. The phrase, don't shoot the messenger, this is where it comes from. The jester would have to tell them horrible news, but in a fun, positive way. For example, back in 1340, King Philip IV, his fleet was destroyed in naval battle, the British completely wiped them out, and it was an otherwise devastating loss, but the jester, the fool, brought this news in a light way. He said to the king, they don't even have the guts to jump into the water like our brave French do. And then he farted and disappeared. Number nine, access to clean water. Today in a modern world, there are things that we just can't live without. A vape pen, Starbucks, and that weird looking back massager that everyone says they bought for their backs, but it's actually for their undercarriage. Speaking of undercarriages, you don't want to drink from the water from underneath one. Dirty, muddy street water is bad for your health. The ancient kings of old knew this. It was common knowledge that drinking dirty water could lead to you spending more time squatting over a hole than spending time with your family, and, and nobody wants that. Life for citizens who were not royals could have it pretty rough. Ancient kings had the luxury of having clean water. Or Somewhat, it's still kind of not so clean, or at least more clean than the commoners. Through methods of fresh spring water, boiling, and even some early filtration methods, they had access to better water that wouldn't make their guts hurt. With that being said, a lot of times, given the sussy nature of water, a lot of kings just drank alcohol, which honestly might have saved them since the alcohol could possibly kill harmful bacteria. The one time in life that boozing might save your life. Anyone got a beer? Number eight, ladies first. 
These ancient kings, they could literally do whatever they wanted. And it's important to note how they would act if they didn't get what they wanted, right? Like George IV of England, he's referred to as England's worst king by historians. Great title, even worse than King Joffrey, what do you know? It's one thing to spiral into debt, that's classic king behavior, MC Hammer went broke, we get it, it happens. But George IV, he was all about the ladies, a little bit too much. All he wanted in life was just to hook up with women, that was it, his only desire in life. And if they weren't interested, George was known to throw fits, he would cry and stomp his feet, literally, you know how those brave and bold kings do. George would offer these ladies money, although they weren't for sale, so that wasn't a great plan and didn't work a lot of the time. And George would go so far to threaten his own well-being if they refused. How terrible is that guy, right? Just imagine that conversation, how insane. What takes this to the absolute next level though is that George would keep a lock of his partner's hair after they had spent the night together. Now I know you're freaking out, maybe you're like, huh, maybe you just choked on your rye bread sandwich a bit, that's more than fair. At the time, this wasn't abnormal behavior. I mean, you know, lovers would exchange their hair instead of phone numbers, I get it, it's back in the old days. But George, he had a lot of hair. He had like a lot, a lot of hair. He had like 7,000 envelopes filled with hair. I'm over here exchanging phone numbers at the club. Like, what am I doing wrong? Am I, doink? Call me, peace. Number seven, Galizo Maria Saforza. This guy was just bad. Like, like all bad. Not like Deadpool where he does some bad stuff for good reasons, anti-hero kind of guy. This, nah, this guy's just straight bad, straight evil. In one story of the disturbed king, he had a rival's hands chopped off or tennis matches. He left prisoners in hanging cages and even had a priest that made a prediction about him that he didn't find all too flattering in prison with little food and water. It got to the point where the man had to eat his own refuse. So if you cross Galeazzo Maria Saforza, um, don't, don't do it. Number six, Ivan the Terrible. I'm not that familiar with Russian history before the year 1900, but there is a lot to unpack. It's not all Lenin and hammers and sickles and such. Ivan the Terrible was the first Tsar of Russia, and he was quite the specimen. From having struck his daughter-in-law and unlifing his son in a fit of rage, he was one nasty dude. However, I believe the story of him in St. Basil's Cathedral is more noteworthy. As the story goes, Ivan commissioned an architect to build St. Basil's Cathedral. If you've ever seen it, you know how gorgeous it is. All the Onion Palace buildings and whatnot, you know what I'm talking about. Ivan was so impressed with the architect's work that he had his eyes gouged out so that no one could ever build another structure or gaze upon another structure as magnificent as the cathedral. That's hardcore, dude. That's pretty hardcore. So if you do a bad job, he probably would have got rid of you. And if you do a good job, he'll still get rid of you. Number five, Ferdinand the First of Naples. This one is so strange. I. I can't even, I, I have to mention, I, I cannot not say it. In a nutshell, Ferdinand looked normal, just your average European king. I mean, what, what could be wrong about this guy, right? He looks pretty normal. Well, the guy was basically Buffalo Bill. Ferdinand liked to keep his enemies close, taken after a little bit of Michael Corleone. However, so close that oftentimes dinner guests would mysteriously disappear and end up not breathing. Afterwards, they would be mummified and pickled and dressed as if they were still alive. He would then invite more guests over for dinner to show them what could happen if they crossed him. He would open the doors and show them a sick dinner-esque area play thing of people dressed up and that's, that's, that's what bad people do. That's what Buffalo Bill would do. That's gross, we don't like that. Number four, Henry VIII. Are you even surprised he's on this list? I mean, come on, it's Henry VIII. But I, I support all healthy marriages and I support healthy divorces. Sometimes things just don't work out, but that doesn't mean you have to go all Johnny Depp on the situation. There's better ways to work things out. Well, in Henry's case, it may not be televised on national TV or global TV in this case. It was more like Edward Scissorhands, if you will. Henry VIII is famous for dealing with his wives. When the church would not grant him the divorce he so wished for, he removed his wife's head from her body. And then he remarried and divorced another, and then he, uh, well, another one lost her head and then divorced another, and then finally he passed away and the wife lived on. It makes sense, sure, that's, all I'm saying is the man went a little too far, that's all I'm saying, just a little bit. 
Number three, John King of England. This is the dude who wrote the Magna Carta, which for legal students everywhere is like planet Krypton. It's where it all starts. A whole Superman, the law, everything. It's the basis of everything. Besides Hammurabi's code, of course. Well, it's not like he signed it very enthusiastically, and the man really wasn't the nicest. He's also known for taking 22 of his most noble knights and throwing them away in a dungeon until they starved and didn't wake up for, well, no breakfast. He betrayed his brother Richard the Lionheart, the very famous Richard the Lionheart, who also wasn't very nice either, and is suspected of being the mastermind behind the delifing of his nephew. Ooh, talk about family scandal. Number two, Napoleon Bonaparte. I know, hear me out though. The story of France and Napoleon is one for the history books. I mean, really, it's, it's so strange. Imagine a country that violently overthrows its king and queen, and then while in the middle of that, which could be described as the worst political strife in history, you then go to war, which, if you know how that, it's, it's not a good idea. You, 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 you're probably gonna lose. Except Napoleon didn't lose. Napoleon took France to war like five times within a, a short time period and won most of them. It's pretty good. Well, good for winning, not good for the people that didn't make it. That's when he declared himself Emperor of France and kind of lost his way, which it's stupid because it defeated the whole purpose and point of the revolution and the democracy that the people were so fighting for. Eventually, the international community caught up with him and banned him to an island twice because he came back and said, I'm back, and then, no, back to the island, go, go back, you're, go, you're going back. Number one, Elvis Presley. Look, I know, I know, it's it's Elvis, but he's the king of rock and roll, man. You, you can't go wrong with Elvis. It, plus, it kind of works, too, because I think people have a really good image of him, but he actually wasn't, you'll see. He is the king of rock and roll, to be fair, and he's more famous than any king on this list, actually, but the king of rock and roll isn't so squeaky clean and certainly not a stranger to crime and scandal. At some points in his career, you could find him excessive drinking and using uh, illicit substances, if you will. He might have had to put on those jailhouse rocking denims, well, for real. Back in 1956, at the peak of his fame, really, Elvis got into a physical altercation with two gas station attendants after fans began to crowd him, it was a messy situation, and he was actually up on charges of battery and disorderly conduct. Not a good look for the king, baby, the king's gotta stay clean. Yeah.